Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Episode number 142, our three-year anniversary episode. I'm Sean and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. So welcome to the show. Tonight, you can expect a more laid back than usual episode, celebrating the fact that we released our first ever podcast three years ago. Now, for the celebration, we will be deviating from our usual format. So if you're just stopping in for the first time to check out our podcast or to check out our show, just know this isn't normally how we would handle things. So it's pretty close. Now, what you can expect tonight is after our usual feedback section is a bit of a retrospective. Highlight some milestones we met the past year and talking about like how many games we played, stuff like that. Uh, we're going to talk about our favorite games that we discovered this year and so on. Now, this is going to be followed by a live Q&A where we're going to be answering anything, gaming-related or not, from the fine folk in our chat room, the lobbyists. We'll be also asking people what their favorite things we did in the past year were. That'll be after the big live Q&A. Now, we are still going to finish off with the games we've been playing lately in the last couple of weeks, as I don't think you can have a gaming podcast and not have that segment. They take our podcast license away if we skip that, as far as I know. We are, we're already rebels by putting it at the end of the show. Now, for those of you here listening to the audio podcast, you can also expect reviews of Tapestry from Stonemeyer Games and Unfair from Good Games Publishing as part of this episode. Welcome to The Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Since this is meant to be a joy-filled episode, we stuck with all the positive comments this week. Yeah. Starting with Alana Pichet, who commented on our Codenames duet, rev duet review to say, thanks for the recommendation, we have enjoyed it. Now this is the kind of feedback I love to hear. Well, short, it points out that someone read and listened to one of our game suggestions, picked up the game and then enjoyed it. One of my biggest joys in board gaming and in this hobby, long before I was the tabletop bellhop, is helping someone discover a new game for them to love. Next up is a comment on our last podcast topic, getting a game played right after cracking the shrink. Theodore Bent writes, Great tips. I was gifted the Fallout board game on my birthday. Quite a complicated system of play. I'll definitely be applying some of this as I learn it. Thanks for your suggestions, as always. You are very welcome, Theodore. Now, Fallout is a game that my wife and I have really enjoyed, but it's one of those... Anyone who's bought a Fantasy Flight game knows what I mean. It's just one of those Fantasy Flight style games with multiple rule books, with tons of rules and little side cases and every little detail, including a paragraph that probably says rules that haven't been covered yet. Now, for that game in particular, for Fallout, what I suggest, honestly, is just get it on the table and start playing. Follow the setup rules, play the basic scenario that comes in it, comes with the game, and just go to it. Like, when you go, you're like, all right, board setup, what do I do? How do I move? Well, you look it up and say, okay, you rolled the dice move. And then you're like, oh, I rolled two stars. Look up what that means. And just look up what you need as you play. There is so much stuff going on in that game. This isn't a game, like even myself, who I, I learn games from rules all the time. You're not going to learn how to play Fallout by reading the rule books from cover to cover. You basically play to see what's going to happen and look up the use the rule book as a reference, not a teaching guide. All right. Well, next, we've got a comment about our space base review, specifically the bit at the end where we compared it to Machikoro and Valeria mm -hmm. Card Kingdoms. Sam D writes such a detailed comparison for me. I had enjoy space base, but. The fiddlier rules and tiny cubes make it hard to play with less experienced gamers and kids. Mm -hmm. I can't trust that something hasn't been screwed up, which is not fun. I'm switching to Valeria Card Kingdoms. Mihalo Dimitrevsky's art is gorgeous. <laughs> Miko's art is gorgeous. Yes. Thanks for helping me to Scott decide. There is a reason everyone calls him the Miko. <laughs> yep. As far as I know, it's Mihalo Dimitrevsky, but... I I may be wrong on that, but I did watch an interview with them. So I'm so glad we could help you out, Sam. Uh, I really hope you enjoy Valeria. As I like to say, I hope you enjoy it half as much as me because I love it. And even half as much, it'd be fantastic. We are all big fans. 
Now, have you gotten your copy of Valeria to the table yet? Sadly, no, as we got huh? distracted by something newer I'll be talking about later. So another thing you might want to watch for is those giveaways we're doing tonight. Meet Co's name may come up again. Now, finally, we've got a comment from a friend of mine from the university days, Sharon Drummond, on our World's Fair 1893 second edition review. They write, this is one of my favorite games. I have the original edition, and it sounds like I won't bother buying the new one. Unfortunate that they didn't do more. Thanks for the review. And I guess you've um, had Sagrada dethroned from being your favorite, Sharon. Oh, you're welcome, Sharon. I I'm right there with you. I, I do appreciate the added diversity in the game. That is something I do give a thumbs up to Renegade Games for. And everyone appreciates a lower price point, right? So you can't complain about that. But I do wish they'd done more in many ways. Though at the same time, I do appreciate that they didn't change a game that I already loved. They didn't ruin it in any way. So I do appreciate that you at least get that same gameplay experience. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. A couple of announcements before we move on to our main topic. I probably should have changed that. A few, quite a few, more than the usual number of announcements tonight. We got lots going on. It's a party. What do you expect? Lots of stuff to tell everyone before they head home. So first off, first thing we're going to do, this is for you, our awesome fans, not just those of you in the chat, though you are awesome as well. We are going to launch a brand new board game giveaway. It is already live over on the blog right now. Now, this time, what I am offering up is my copy of Watergate from Capstone Games. And what I'm going to do is toss in the Meeple Realty wooden insert for the game as well. In this case, the game has been played, but the insert is still sealed in shrink wrap. The game itself is in mint condition, only played enough times for us to give it a proper review. Now, I realize when I picked this game, it probably seems odd to fans of the show and people who listen to our Watergate review for us to give away a game we didn't actually like that much. But the thing is, Deanna and I disliking this game seems to make us the outliers. Everyone else seems to love this game. This game's got an 8 rating on Board Game Geek, and it's in the top 100 strategy games of all time. That is a big category, one of the biggest categories on Board Game Geek. Now, because of this, I think it just makes sense to pass this very popular game onto someone who will probably enjoy it more than we have. As usual, this contest will run for three weeks. It will be open to residents of the U.S. and Canada. To enter, you just have to head over to tabletopbellhop.com, find the giveaway article that should be live by the end of the day today. Actually, it's live now. We weren't sure if we were going to get that one done in time. It is. So good luck to everyone who enters. Now, as a bonus for those of you who are here live, just to show that we do really appreciate you stopping in tonight, we are offering up three bonus entries for our three-year anniversary. Well, on the widget, just choose the anniversary party option, which will have you enter a code, which we're about to drop in the chat. Now, sticking with the topic of giveaways, you know what? Why don't we give something away right now? Someone right now, another trivia question. Well, we usually open giveaways to everyone. We want to let our live supporters know just how important they are to us week in and week out. Answer the trivia question to win prizes like the Romeo and Juliet promo cards for Council of Verona or the Blackmailer promo card for Cash and Guns 2nd Edition. This is one that actually hasn't come up on the podcast for a while, possibly even in the last year, something we used to mention all the time, and it hasn't actually come up. So this, this one, you might have to dive a little deep. What is the Bellhop's Law? Nice! It's yep. close enough, in my opinion. Yep, yep, absolutely. Can you ding or D? Oh, just, just after. There we go. That's correct. The best game in your game collection is the one that hits the table, the games that actually get played. Yep. Doesn't matter how pretty it is, how much it costs, how many miniatures it's got, how, who, how much it kickstarted for, who the designer is. None of that matters if the game doesn't get played. Congratulations, Courtney. We probably should be putting in who won here since I put a foot for it. But mm. Nice. Yeah, you got in there. That was good. That was good. So again, Deanna will contact you and let you know. Uh, this we need to do before we move on. So due to having to miss recording last week, which I do apologize, anyone who did try to show up, unfortunately, something came up with my dad. 
we still haven't actually announced the winner of our space based giveaway, other than me contacting Kelvin and telling him it's not him. <laughs> that lucky gamer was John Ayers from Tennessee. Now, John's shiny new sealed copy of Space Base is already in the mail and hopefully over the border by now. So congratulations, John. Since the very start, we've been here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. That has been our goal. That's our mission statement. That is what we do. That's what we're here to do. This is what we've set out to do since the, the first time I came up with the name Tabletop Bellhop which was like two to three years before we actually got far enough to actually be live and talking to you fine folk. Our goal is to make everyone's game night better. Offering up things like gaming advice, game information, game night hosting advice, reviews of games, unboxings to show you what come in games, game suggestions, and everything else we offer. Now, looking back at the last three years, I am very happy to say that I don't think we've ever lost our way. Our goal remains unchanged. Though I will say the way we go about achieving it and what we do offer to you has evolved over time. We've evolved plenty, both technically and in how the show is organized. But that core idea, mm -hmm. that vision, our brand essentially, has remained steady throughout. Now, this is also something I don't expect to ever change. If we did change this, I think I'd relaunch a different podcast. I have no intention of doing that, though. I have no intention of changing the format of our show or the type of content we provide. Our main goal will always be primarily to answer your gaming and game night questions. Now, I will hint at the fact that Deanna has been working on some stuff that will hopefully bring our advice to more people in a different format. And as usual, things are going to change over time, hopefully always for the better. We will continue to evolve the content we provide but the end goal will stay the same. While live viewers know every week there's a lot of sausage making that happens on camera, yeah. there's even more off. And one of the key deciding factors is always if it makes sense for us, for mm -hmm. what we do. We are what we are, and while that may keep us from being number one since we aren't ahead of the curve on the new hotness, that's okay. Yeah. There are people who do that and do that very well. Mm -hmm. Now, while we have room to grow in our niche, making your game night better is still the focus. All right, as part of today's celebration, before we get to answering some questions from the chat room live, I want to highlight some of the milestones that we hit specifically this past year. Uh, we're looking July to July, basically, not just in 2021. Um, and these are things that I think are things we should be proud of and things I kind of want to highlight. And these aren't in any particular order. They're more as I thought about them. And welcome to join in, Deanna or Sean, if you have some other things to add. So one of the ones I'm most proud of is we hit 6,000 6K Instagram followers. That doesn't sound like a huge number, right? Like we're no influencers. We're no people showing off jewelry or vacation spots and palm trees in the background. For a board game Instagram account, that's actually really solid. Now, of course, we would love to hit 10,000. When you hit 10,000, you can do the special thing where you can include links so then people could see, hey, our new podcast is live and swipe down and go to the podcast. We don't have that now. So there's the goal is to get to 6,000 or sorry, 10,000. But right now I am damn proud of getting to 6,000. That took longer than I thought it would. But then once I saw how slow the curve is, I'm really glad we got there. Now, along with that, one of the things that we did that gave us a big bump in the last year is I started using Instagram reels, which was actually a follow up to something I did do this last year, which is make a TikTok account for Tabletop Bellhop. Because uh, that's the, the hot new thing, right? That's what all the kids are using and all the adults are using and everyone's using. That's the one that the, the big brands want to make sure you're on there. And like, you know, Toys R Us wants you to record hand washing videos and stuff like that. So I, I made an account. I, it's, I put up a few videos. Uh, I'll admit I'm not overly proud of them, except for the fact I did it. Like, yeah, I finally did it. And they're getting like compared to our Instagram numbers, ridiculous views. So it does seem like it's worth it. So we're modern, right? We're, we're on the hot new thing, though I'm sure by now there's probably something hotter and newer than Tic Tac. Tic Tac, yeah, there we go. Now I'll prove I'm an old man. <laughs> I'll say Tic Tac into TikTok. 
So that is something I do plan to do more of. I, I, I want to do more with uh, Instagram reels. I had Twitter just started doing videos too. And YouTube now has some kind of short segment video. Thing. Uh, Twitter's already canceled. It's uh, okay. It's good. Fleets, fleets, there, are, we, fleets are canceled. Fleets are canceled. All right. I don't have to worry about that one. YouTube just launched something for like one minute to three minute videos. Maybe we'll dive into that, but I record some videos. The biggest thing is I can't remember. I never remember to take video now. I have a hard, I'm finally at the point where I tend to remember to grab my phone and take pictures when we're playing a game. Remembering to take a vertical video now when I'm playing games, this just hasn't sunk in yet. Now, speaking of YouTube, we did hit 1,000 followers on YouTube, which is awesome. That lets us do some cool stuff like monetize the channel and realize just how little pay YouTube pays small creators like us. Like it's 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 a joke. It it really is. Though I'm not sure what's worth running ads here on Twitch or actually making money on YouTube. But you know what? It's something. It's it's a very small portion of our income stream, but every little bit helps. Now, aside from money, which we admit is is part of it, not really to be uh, talked about, we did also unlock some other content features with that mm. milestone. And while YouTube runs ads, whether you like it or not, yeah. we get a little bit of control over them once we hit that 1K mark. Yeah, trust me, if I left it on auto, you would be getting eight to 12 ads per video. I knocked that down to a maximum of one every half hour and sometimes less than that, usually less than that. I, I had uh, I had somebody, one of the one of the Hermitcraft uh, YouTubers I know the uh, the other day left. He obviously left his on auto and oh. in a 20 minute video, there were seven ad breaks. Yep. Sounds that sounds about right. It was it was literally unwatchable. <laughs> That sounds about right. Yes, uh, Ryan is pointing out there is the option of paying for a YouTube sub. That gives you ad-free. Everyone, please pay for a YouTube sub for our channel. That would be fantastic. <laughs> sub to YouTube and watch us because we actually get paid for that too. Again, minuscule, little tiny amount. But if enough sub people watch us, we do get some money off that. <laughs> yeah, I, we have no control of the ads or how long they are. Uh, we can try to space out how often they're there, but sometimes YouTube will insert more. So we do what we can. Now, one of the things we did do to improve things on YouTube is we finally figured out, and it was a new feature, and I think the feature launched within the last year, but it took us a while to um, get it set up, is chapters to our video, breaks, chapter breaks in our videos. And I got to say, I dig this. That was something I've, I had requests for, the people that request them. I went got back to them like, yeah, yeah, so much better. So now you can skip ahead to different sections. But even more importantly to me, like, that's great. User experience, better user experience is awesome. That's on YouTube side. But it seems like that was like praying to the algorithm gods. So by putting those in, our views jumped up significantly, which is great. Our, our number of, not to say people will watch, but the number of people at least see our videos coming up. And it looks fantastic on Google. If you Google search and get one of our videos at the top of the page, it actually says segments of this video and it's all linked and it looks awesome. I'm like, oh, that is great. So I do dig that one a lot. Another YouTube thing I did is I put my face on the videos which it hasn't been long enough to really tell if it's making a difference. But we have had quite a few people say that they actually look good and that they catch people's eye more. So hopefully that gives us a few more views. I don't know. That yeah. seems to be the trend. The, the feedback has been positive and we already know. I mean, we've known all along, essentially, that if you put a face on your you know, thumbnail, it gets more views. Yeah. It's just how things work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that um, the other thing we've done is we have entered the Rogue Trader Warhammer universe. Uh, we broke 40,000 podcast downloads this last year. As of right now, we're actually at 48,180 downloads to date, heading for that landmark 50,000. Which maybe that'll mean something to some algorithm somewhere. I don't know. Um, one of the things, though, that, that like, I don't know if I don't think that I should do anything is that let us brag and say we have 50,000 downloads, which is kind of cool. It looks nice but on we, the cut sheet. <laughs> yeah, it looks good, right? Looks good. Maybe maybe we'll get more games to review. Uh, we did get another five star Apple podcast review, and this does make a difference. Like, I, I'm going to take a moment here, right? Everyone in the chat, we're giving stuff away. It's our party and we're giving stuff away. So maybe that's a little backwards. Like, shouldn't people be giving us gifts? Well, if you did want to, one of the best things you could do is go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes, whatever they call it now. I'd switch back and forth a couple of times. Find the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast and leave a review. 
I don't even care if it's a five-star review. It'd be awesome. I would hope that anyone who wants to say thank you would leave a five-star review, but I don't care. Having reviews on Apple is one of the things that costs you nothing, but really does help us get a bump in views on iTunes, which hopefully will lead to a bump in downloads. The more reviews we have, the more people who see our show show up on recommendations. Like when they Google when they Google uh, gaming podcast or cardboard or tabletop gaming podcast, there's a better chance we show up closer to the top of the list. And thank you very much, Brian. All right. And while Apple is still the bread and butter, it's not the only player mm -hmm. anymore. A review or a rating on Spotify is growing in value. Yep. And in fact, just listening to us on Spotify helps them uh, helps tell them that we're doing something right and they pay attention to who's listening to what. And I know there, we, I know we have, I think two listeners who use Spotify. <laughs> so yeah, we have a couple. There are, there are two people out there who apparently listen to us on Spotify and thank you very much for them. Uh, but uh, if you do listen on Spotify, uh, whatever their rating system is, well, we'd appreciate uh, some yeah. notice. Thank you very much. All right, next, something more gaming related that I think the fans are going to care a little bit more about than how many YouTube views we have. We have reviewed over 150 games in the past three years. That's on average 50 games a year, which is pretty cool. And to be honest, that number should keep growing because we used to do one review a show. Sometimes we didn't even do one review a show now we're trying to do two a show so i expect that number to ramp up quickly but 150 games like these are detailed reviews these aren't just games we talked about in the hey i played this last weekend this is the whole check out what's in the box here's what i thought should you buy it or not reviews 150 games i'm proud of that number i like that number and while we will always prefer gaming in person given the chance we mm -hmm. had, did finally dive into tabletop simulator yeah. and added it as one more tool in our belts to help learn play review and have fun with games yeah the nice part about that one is it's let sean play games we're reviewing which for a long time was kind of like well if sean can't make it down he doesn't get to try the games and he'll ask questions and he'll look up stuff on board game geek and take part in um take part in our discussions but basically it's kind of like me and deanna's thoughts because you never actually got a chance so it's awesome to be able to uh the two reviews we're recording later as part of this show tomorrow uh will also be two games that sean got to play because of tabletop simulator now another place we've started helping out folks is on amazon Yep. Now, while many of you are familiar with our affiliate links and some of the Twitter accounts out there, we also now provide our unboxing videos to Amazon.com mm -hmm. to help people interested in game on their site see what's in the box. Yeah, I'm actually, I, it's, it's actually kind of a privilege. I was selected to be an Amazon.com influencer uh, based on reviews I had left on the site and the fact that I had a web page with a certain viewer account. And because of that, I actually have something special called an influencer account. That's part of our associate account, which is where we get our affiliate links from, that lets me do some additional things like actually upload videos to, um, to YouTube, or sorry, to Amazon. And we have some that are hot. Um, our the crew and Dungeons and Dragons Adventure Begins get over 500 views a month, which I know it's not huge, huge, but to me, that's pretty big. So it's something you will see on a couple of Amazon pages. Plus, you know what I should drop? I'll drop a link in the chat, actually. Um, I'll drop a link to our influencer page because we do have one. And the other thing we also offer on there is game lists. I have my top whatever 50 games of all times there. I've got our best two player games list there as well as a bunch of our deals. And no, the crew does not come with a free ticket to space. Ah, uh, no, it does not. So, overall, unless Deanna or anyone else can think of any other milestones, we've had more and more people in chat room every time. We had our best Twitch stream ever where we had over 50 people in our room at once. Thank you, Renegade Games, for hosting us. <laughs> now that we finally figured out where they came from, still appreciated. We've had some great stuff. And what I love the most is that we haven't plateaued. We're still going up. Things continue to grow, and that's awesome. We're working with more publishers than ever. We have discovered some fantastic games this last year because of that. We have I met and interacted with more people in the board game industry, even without cons going on. 
Like I have interacted with more people on Facebook and Twitter and made more connections. I think our name's starting to get out there a bit more, be a bit more recognized. I got to admit, it's one of those like in, in Windsor, everyone knows Mo was a thing for a long time. I think online, everyone knows Tabletop Bellhop. Like if you mention it, like, oh yeah, yeah, Tabletop, he's the deal guy. I get that a lot. Or yeah, yeah, he's Matt's Mo, he's a cool guy. But like, like we're not Tom Vassal big or anything, but like, I just think the name gets recognized, right? Like people are like, oh yeah, yeah, I know who that is. They may not be active followers interacting with us all the time, but at least they know we're out there. And I think that's awesome. Now, speaking of ancient, ancient, I don't know where that came from. I have no idea where Ancient came from. Uh, speaking of awesome games that came out in the last year, because Ancient Games did not come out last year. I know what it is. It's because I'm about to talk about the new hotness, and my brain's just like, no, no, we don't talk about that here. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to the next topic, right? So here's what I want to finish off with in this discussion. Despite the fact we couldn't game in person for most of the last year, both of us did manage to get in a fair number of in-person games. Sean did manage to make it down to Windsor a couple times, though unfortunately not for the best reasons, except the 100th birthday was pretty cool. Um, you also got to try a number of new games this year, both with us and the kids. We tried out new games with uh, with the kids and our, our close family, extended family, not the people in our house, but not too far away. Um, so we did get to try a bunch of new things and also a ton of stuff online. So I've got two questions I want to I want to discuss. First, what's our most played game this year? And second, most played games. You know, let's do top five or so. And what's your favorite and my favorite new to us game, new to you game? Now, again, you know us. We're probably not going to be new hotness. It was released just this year, but maybe it will. And these don't have to overlap. Your favorite game doesn't have to be your most played game. Uh, sadly, it almost never is, I find, with people. So for me, top five most played games this year, uh, in order of how many times we played them, I'm not going to give you the numbers because I didn't write those down. Space Space, Aventuria Adventure Card Game, The Crew, Fairy Season, which really surprised me, but it's just so it's so quick, rapid fire games that we played multiple rounds. And Tapestry is already up there. And we've only been playing that one for a couple weeks now. Now, no, this is if you don't count Race for Galaxy on Board Game Arena. Though those all did beat out Seven Wonders on Board Game Arena. Now, I never count my Board Game Arena plays for stats. Um, I just never, never decided or decided never to, to do that for whatever. Now, Space Base actually ended up as one of my top uh, top play games. So Space nice. Base, Harry Potter's Hogwarts Battle and DC Deck Builder was a three way tie for oh, wow. most played games. Uh, and then Unfair slipped in there as well. Uh, now, the crew should probably make it on that list yeah. as well. But again, it was BGA only, even though we were playing it sort of separately as a group. It was just a BGA. Uh, I don't know. If, if I if I add live chat to my game, I'm, I record all of them. But personally, I'm like, Sean, you should record the ones like when we hang out with patrons or we sit together and we all play something online together. To me, that's it's a special enough event that you're gaming with other people and not when, when you're playing real time and not turn based. Right. I don't know. To me, to me, I would list those. But again, I list all my my BGA plays as well. So I was shocked by Seven Wonders. That just means that I just haven't been taking my turn very often, I think. Now, as for my favorite new to me game, again, new to me, this didn't necessarily release in 2021. Actually, it definitely didn't. Um, <laughs> this is hard, like, like really hard. Like everyone loved our top 10 of the top thousand. This is harder than that. This is way harder than that. Like, like, and there's so many apples to apples. Like there's so many, or so many apples to oranges, no apples to apples or, <laughs> or variants with black text on white backgrounds. None of that. Uh, <laughs> we discovered so many great games this year. Like, like, Right now, we're loving on Tapestry. Like, we, we're playing a ton of Tapestry. I just tried it out solo. Uh, we're digging that. We're loving Space Space, especially slowly adding. We're still trying to discover um, Shy Pluto. Um, possibly this weekend, we'll finish that off. So Space Space is up there. And out of those two games, oh, they're so, so good. And then I realized, I'm like, this isn't Pile of Obligation, but Quacks of Quedlinburg I discovered this year. Despite seeing people playing it before the pandemic, I finally got to try it. And holy cow, that's got to be on our Cat and Tori list. They are going to love that game. And then there's Funfair and Unfair, both amazing games. And, and of the two, like Unfair has got the cutthroat, but Funfair is so easy to teach. And then there's a weird, obscure indie stuff that was really good, like Scora. 
And then, like, I got Great Western Trail for my birthday, and that is an amazing Alexander Pfister game. Um, Wonder Woman, the cooperative board game, was a sleeper hit. More people should be talking about this game. Reef, to me, is, like, up there with Azul and Sagrada for abstract games with awesome pieces. Then you got, like, Rail Pass. A, a train game pick up and deliver train game where you pick up and deliver trains like that just so but how do i compare is that that better than tapestry but they're two all oh, so many great games yeah no i for me it would have to be um again picking one is so hard because i played uh eclipse second dawn for my first time yeah. which was a fantastic great sci-fi game which is right in my leash mm -hmm. Clash of quedlinburg i've only gotten a chance to try once and we really haven't explored much but it was so much fun, and I got such a good feeling playing Quacks. Um, and then Unfair uh, is right up there. Mm -hmm. And I've now also been enjoying the newest game in my collection, which is Marvel Strike Teams with my son. Uh, but I think out of the, the games in this past year, uh, I got to put Space Base up there as yeah. I think my number one for the year. I could see it. I wasn't sure if Eclipse might beat that out. I think Eclipse with more plays may beat out Space Space just for a more epic game night. Now, if I had to pick just one, it's not even one of the ones I just listed, actually. It's gonna, I, this was the biggest surprise to me this year. And that is how much Deanna and I have been loving the Adventure Adventure card game. Like anyone who stuck around for that after show. So what happened was I was reached out by Ulysses Spiel, and they basically said, you're an awesome reviewer. We dig you. We like your stuff. Is it okay if we send you some Aventuria stuff? No strings attached. You don't have to review it. But if you talk about it online, that'd be great. That was it. That was our agreement. And then this box showed up. This box that was even more impressive than Rising Sun showing up from Komini or not when I went all in for the Kickstarter. And it was a clown car. Because I just kept pulling out box after box after box after box. And I think the end stack was on my floor about this high. Like we're looking four or five feet high pile of stuff. And I was just like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? And then it took us a while to get to it because that was intimidating. First off, I'm like, where do you start? And to be honest, it isn't easy. There, there wasn't a box that said core or anything like that. So I had to reach out and find out what it was. And then we finally tried it. And oh, my gosh, was it good? Like, I have tried a number of card-driven pseudo RPG games, right? Where you're playing a character, there's advancement, you're going on adventures. Adventuria blows all of them away. The, the stories are fantastic. It's got that German Warhammer kind of feel. The mechanics are solid. The artwork's excellent. The gameplay is engaging. The way they make every adventure is just a boss fight, but it's everyone is different and interesting. It has almost everything I want in an adventure card game. And from what I am told, the stuff that's missing is coming. Things like branching paths, more decision points, a better campaign system and progression system where your characters will actually improve over play is all coming with the newest Kickstarter for the German edition. So who knows when it's going to come over here, but I am really looking forward to it. Yeah, and while I really enjoyed the online version and it's really well implemented, I have to say I'm sad not to be in Windsor as I think this would be such a fun campaign to go on with mm -hmm. you too. Well, at this rate, there'll still be boxes down here for us to play uh, if, whenever you do make it down. But for now, I think that's enough patting ourselves on the back. I think it's about time we head over and check with the lobby and open things up for our anniversary Q&A. All right. One of the things I didn't expect when we started out and launched this show was just how important our fans would be to our content, in specific, the interaction with our fans. Yes, I, the, the whole point was answering someone's question every week, but I was just expecting like to get that an email and we'd answer the question and then maybe we'd get some feedback from other people on our answers. That's, that's what I was expecting. I was not expecting the Twitch experience. I was not expecting the chat room. I wasn't expecting to have all these awesome folk join us every week or the great people who comment and share and interact with our content on social media. Or even just the emails I get. I get emails every week now. Something about the blog or something about this or something about the content or some thank you for sharing a deal. I love the fact 
that this is actually something we've grown to be known for, that our interaction is something that people look forward to in our show. And it's something that people recognize us for. Like people are like, oh, Tabletop Bellhop does a great job of addressing your questions. It's really interactive. They, the guys are great and they talk to us all the time. And that is awesome. And I really hope that never changes. And I never considered recording live ever. Yep. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how I got suckered into it with the additional technical requirements it entails. But I'm not at all sad to have met our awesome fans, both those current regulars yep. and those who no longer visit us as often. Yep. So overall, I wouldn't change a thing now that we're doing it. Whatever happened to Shadzar? He was back for a little while, then mm. vanished again. You're all welcome back if you wish, and we always welcome new people, of course. Because honestly, interacting with you fine folk is the highlight of my week. And with that, I just want to open up the floor to our lobby, the chat room. Feel free to ask us anything you want. And to be honest, this is our anniversary episode. Like we always say we're doing live Q&As or AMAs, but we do try to stick it to gaming topics. It's a party. Forget that. Just ask whatever you want. And if you've got a nice, big, complicated, detailed game night question, hold on. Not tonight. Let's keep them quick, simple, so we can hammer through them. And then save that big content. Quite, uh, big content? Big question for a regular episode. If you've got a good one. I know Rogers actually already sent a couple to us today mm -hmm. on our Discord that I'm looking forward to diving into. And my initial response on house rules was meant to be a bit flippant, though it may not have come off that way. But we'll get to those. Not tonight. I want nice, simple, quick pound through them. I want to hear all kinds of questions. Ready, set, go. All right. First question from Razul. He did manage to set up a board game swap con nice. for the 21st. Any last minute advice? Ah, uh, swap con. Uh, well, I, we already talked about our ticket system. I don't know if you're going to go with that. We are not the experts on this. Um, we, we have organized a local trading event. And again, what we've done is a ticket system. So ticket system we use is you get one ticket for a small game, more tickets for a medium game, even more tickets for a big game. You decide what those categories are. You hand in your game, you get your tickets. Once everyone's handed in their games and has their tickets, you then roll initiative and you start picking up games by paying your tickets. So you bring five small games, you might be able to get a big game, right? That's the way that works. I found that worked really well. <laughs> <laughs> The problem is with board, we've always done it with role-playing games. With board games, it might be a little rougher, especially the thing that's hard to do is worrying about perceived value of your games. That's the hardest thing on a swap meet, right? It makes perfect sense if, you, if you're all like, oh, I'm just going to swap this size game for this size game because the boxes are about the same size. But then when you got someone who's got this rare 1987, never played, unpunt, like how, does, how many tickets is that one? Um, so watch for people also who are going to give undue value to their games. You may not want them participating in that type of a trade. Now, if you're doing that type of trade, I don't know, um, use sites like boardgameprices.com maybe, I don't know, to try to um, find value. Hopefully, you just got a bunch of people who will happily just trade games. Now, honestly, what I do recommend next time is try to set up a math trade. Uh, if you are interested in doing that, send me a direct message. I'll get a hold of the person in Windsor who ran the two, the two I took part in. And he sent me to some tutorial sites. I'll find links to those. Because what I like about that is a math trade removes all that. You're distanced from it. It's just an algorithm. You put in the games you have up. Then you get a list of everyone's games. Then you just click on which ones you're interested in. Then the algorithm will pick out the possible matches and then it'll ask you, are you okay trading this for this? Are you okay trading these two for this? Are you okay trading this for this? You say yes to those. Then it does all the math and it goes, okay, you give this game to Sean. You give this to Deanna. Deanna's going to give this to Sean. Sean's going to give this to you. You do this old trade. Everyone watches the stuff they want. I strongly recommend math trades because they remove that. But I had this game as a kid and I loved it. So it's worth $50, even though it's something that you'd find at a yard sale. So apparently he's got a uh, someone who's, who's running a math trade table at the event. So oh, there you go. So awesome. that's, I would hook up with that person and, and possibly go with that. I said it's rough. I don't I don't know your local game groups. Honestly, the ones I've done here have went really well, but we have gotten pushback. We have had a number of local gamers who think their stuff's gold who weren't willing to take part and follow our rules because they wouldn't get the appropriate number of tickets for their games, which I said, that's fine. Don't take part. Yeah. You're like, but you're doing a public event. I'm like, 
do your own trade. Like, <laughs> like if you guys want to trade your super expensive first printing books for lots of money, go do that over there. We're doing this. If you want to take part in this, take part. Otherwise don't. Yeah. All right. Uh, T's Luggy Gray Owl, best vegan, vegan dish for game night for vegan. Uh, dish. I am. I am so not vegan that, that I, uh, most vegan foods not greasy um i'm thinking like steamed broccoli i don't know I, I'm, I'm not I'm, um i've seen people do amazing stuff with cauliflower i i can't help you on this one there there you're like i said i don't necessarily need well that's still a game night question deanna may be able to help out on that one um black beans black beans are awesome high in protein maybe a black bean dip or something with um with corn chips i know sean's not a corn chip fan a seven layer dip there you go there's a popular one. The problem with dips, though, is then you're going to get stuff, get stuff on your hands. Math guy Dave, this is the worst answer of all time. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. Apparently, the correct answer is vegan bra- or vegan brats. 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 So you, you'd have to like cook those, though, right? That's greasy. The, the, you know what? Anything, any vegan dish is good for game night as long as you keep it away from the games. There there's, the, there's the bellhop answer. There's the one. The bellhop answer is whatever vegan food you like, as long as you keep it separate from the damn games. All right. That, that's a Mo answer. Roger Dodger Games asks How often have you played a Kickstarter game on Tabletop Simulator and been convinced to buy it? Quick one Never. Never. Absolutely. Never. No, nope, never, not at all. I, uh, to be honest, we're now trying um, to be tabletop well, simulator games. We are more than also, I was before. Before I refused, but also I have to say, you are possibly not doing yourself a favor by putting just uh, tabletop simulator games on your uh, uh, on a page because not always is tabletop simulator the best way to show off a game, as we have learned. No. Definitely not. Like I, I'm pretty sure Sean would never pick up Tapestry if we didn't tell him it was good. Well, wow, that was Tabletopia. That was even that worse. was Tabletopia. So either one. I think yeah. I, I, I keep saying Tabletop Simulator. I'm assuming he mean, means. I, I to be honest, I refuse this. I, we get reach contacted all the time to review games on Tabletop Simulator, and I refuse because to me, a big part of the game is that tactile experience. And all of our reviews, we have a section. We do unboxing videos. We talk about what gets in it. I talk about how thick the rule book is and how heavy the parts are and how tactile it is, what I liked, what I didn't. Does the stuff punch well? To me, all of that is really important parts of a game. Digital, when you're doing that, you don't know. Like, it looks great on this table and it's got great artwork, but that doesn't tell me if the cards stick together or if they're so slippery, they can't stay stacked. It doesn't tell me the dice because they etched them actually aren't weighted well. So when I roll them, they're not random or I, I, I don't know. And Roger, has I have a point. I'm, it's the only way to show a prototype at the moment. And that he, is true. he is correct. But the problem is prototypes don't show off your game very well. Um, yeah. you're, you're better off. It, depending on the game, and again, this there, there's so many variables here, but in some cases, you are better off writing a really good Kickstarter, putting really good art, renderings, mm-hmm. whatever you have available up there, and expressing your love for the game through text and images, mm-hmm. rather than risking a player having a bad experience because of the system that is Tabletop Simulator or Tabletopia, mm-hmm. whichever it is. Um, now, I mean, if you're confident about your implementation on tabletopia and tabletop simulator that's one thing but even then uh you know what there's a lot of people who have never maybe used tabletop simulator so Mm -hmm. you as someone who programmed the whole thing might think it's fantastic but a new player who's maybe only used tabletop simulator for a couple of games could sit down and have a really bad experience even though that doesn't represent what your game is putting forward The other thing, too, is if you are trying to launch a Kickstarter, you really need to get a physical prototype out to someone. You need to show off how it's going to look. I would not back a Kickstarter that only had tabletop simulator reviews and a tabletop simulator way to play it. Now, get prototypes out. I know it costs money. I also know many content creators charge for previews. That's all part of the the cost of doing business nowadays. Get people playing it and touching the things and explaining how the game works. Now, what I do say is, yes, have a tabletop simulator mod. Have a way for people to play your game. I love the fact that most Kickstarters nowadays, I could go try it. 
for me, it's not generally what I'm going to do. And no, so far it hasn't had me convinced to buy a game, but two of the things I think you almost need to have on a Kickstarter nowadays for a modern game is the full rule book available for download and some way to play it, whether that's tabletop simulator, tabletopia, print and play available, let people try it, especially in the days of COVID where I can't go down to origins and play your game. I think it needs to be there. I honestly think Sean and I may be the outliers that we wouldn't get sold by a tabletop simulator. More and more people are using it. And like I said, a year ago, if you would ask me this question a year ago, I'd be like, I haven't even, I don't even have a tabletop simulator. I don't own it. I don't plan on making an account. I hate playing on there. And I admit, I still don't like it much, but it has let us play games we couldn't before. So I do appreciate its use. And I do think there is a valid use for it on Kickstarters. But also, I think you need the tactile, like you need both. You need to, you need at least get the opinions of trusted reviewers to to touch the game and play with your prototypes and everything else. So no, I have not. Sean has not. But to be honest, I when's the last time I backed a Kickstarter? Like <laughs> like the last time I backed the Kickstarter was Coyote and Crow after our um, episode on on native game designers. Yep. That's the last time I backed a Kickstarter, and I mainly did that out of uh, support for the project instead of needing a new game. That was to support the creator and the idea behind it, which I still fully support. That wasn't about me buying a new game. But we're board game media. I do get review copies of games, and I have a pile of obligation, and I'm trying to get through that. So, All right. Well, Ryan's got a thought. Now, we've talked about this at other times. We talked about it uh, a bit uh, in the Discord. Uh, mm. So let's do a quick capsulation. What are your thoughts on the TMG situation? All right. So I, I basically shared my thoughts on the Discord, and I don't want to say too much because right now there is way too much speculation out there. There are a lot of people talking about this who don't actually know what's going on, and I don't want to add to that. So what I do, from what I understand, again, I, I don't want to add much to this. They have declared bankruptcy. They have let some people go. This sucks. TMG makes some awesome games. This is also the writing's been on the wall for a very long time. Like we're talking last two, three years. I'm actually surprised they made it this far. What is the most disappointing for the industry is the stuff I am seeing from people who work with them, not from TMG themselves. So designers who have TMG signed a game and then promised to publish it in 2020 and 2023, now not knowing what's happening with their game. Can you imagine being a game designer and you just sold your next big game to TMG, a nice big place, and they're going to be at Origins promoting your game. And now you're not set for life, but like you've done it. You made it. You're in the industry or you're you're I, I throwing a name out of the hat. Martin Wallace does a game with TMG and you're Martin Wallace totally counting on your third quarter. This game is going to come out and pay your meals for the rest of the week. Right. I'm not saying TMG and Martin Wallace <laughs> have anything together. That's just the first designer that popped in my head. I feel really bad for those people because now you have people who were counting on TMG to do something for them that probably won't happen. Now, from what I understand, TMG is not gone yet, but who knows? And I don't really want to speculate any more than that. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's enough speculation going on out there already. Uh, moving on, Razul502, what's your most memorable episode or topic? Uh, <laughs> this one's going to sound familiar in a little while. I really dug the 10 out of the thousand. That was that was probably one of the most fun we had interacting with the chat room because everyone was playing along and everyone was comparing lists. And then we all got excited about it. So we we're like, wait, wait, let's see which list ended up on the list the most often and try to do a people's choice. That was way more fun than I thought it was going to be. That was awesome. Again, thanks to Board Game Blitz for the original idea. And I think they got it from someone else. They and I did get who, it from someone else. I forget. Who as well. it, brother, it might have been Brothers Murph. I'm sorry. I don't remember who you got it from, but they got it. And I'm like, yes, we kind of we we uh, fake it if you can't make it kind of thing. That was a lot of fun. I, I had a lot of fun with that. Um, for, me, for me, honestly, <laughs> it was my my five supers review. Uh, no, I that was good because I don't review anything. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm here as the host. I'm here to uh, support you and, and, and make sure and help help other people uh, with you. My original concept on the show was to be the everyman who wasn't a board game. Uh, there's a lot of cooking shows and things who have like the chef and the normal. Right. And I was supposed to be the normal to your, you know, board yes. game chef sort of thing. Uh, and it hasn't really gone that way. Cause I 
play a lot of games with you. Yes. Um, well, you get excited when we talk about it. What was funny is you said, I'm not a board game, not board gamer. <laughs> and I'm just laughing about I'm the fact that you're like, I'm not a board game. I'm well, a regular we, we did person. Have, we did have that awesome topic. Where yes, we did. That, that was a good, that was a good um, AMA, actually. Where, which, which games are you? Which we're not going to go back there. We might start crying again. <laughs> but <laughs> That one was uh, good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, memorable talk. The, the Master of the Universe was definitely a memorable, telling everyone to stay the hell away from that game. Um, I don't know. The the indigenous episode to me was one of the ones I did the most research on. And that was memorable in the fact that I'm like, oh, surely there'll be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 games to pick from. And I'm like, I I I fought to find 12. And that's just sad and disappointing. And it just threw the reality of it right in my face, which is part of why I backed Coyote and Crow. Um, so that was a memorable one. Like, like that actually had a, an impact to me. It's, it's, it threw it like, yes, I know. I see it all the time. I hear it all the time. We hear about people of color. We hear about minorities. We're old white guys. We have enough privilege that we could completely miss that, right? Like we could completely overlook it. And I think we're pretty aware and we knew that it's a problem, but that threw it in our face. Like, like doing that research was wow there really aren't native games out there like yes there are some and they look cool but like there really aren't when care paired to the rest of the world it's 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 a grain of sand on a beach it's it's shocking and i'm sure that also goes if we dive dove into other instead of native american if we picked another subculture we probably have the same thing all right, uh, moving on. Uh, I want to. I want to know if Deanna's got an answer on this one. So, oh yeah, if Deanna wants to jump in with a memorable episode topic, there we go. I, I would like to hear that one. Hear, hear from the back backstage of the. Uh, I see more questions flying around too, so I'm going to jump over to Math Guy Dave. Have we watched the Master of the Universe series? I'm assuming Master of the Universe Revelations, the brand new one. We are four or five episodes in. Um, Without not trying to sound like one of those guys, it wasn't what I expected. And what I'm actually upset about, what it actually is compared to what I expected, was the bait and switch, the false advertising they did. They spent a heck of a lot of time showing off two characters that are bit parts in the show. And it's not that I think they should be the heroes and I love what they did and I like the story they're telling because I don't want to spoil it. And I do dig who the new main character is. I have no problem with any of that. But don't show me a bunch of ads for something else. So here's here's my take. One, I love it. Um, huge fan of it. I never saw an ad for it. So I I've See, never I, did. I didn't expect any. Uh, my concern my 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 annoyance with the the bait and switch people, and this obviously isn't you, but there's a yeah. whole lot of people out there saying Kevin Smith pulled a bait and switch because Kevin Smith no, was, was, was promoting. And and I have been listening to Kevin Smith podcasts, not recently, but I listened to him from when he first started. Yes. Part of guess. my inspiration for getting us a show was because I loved Kevin talking with his friends in podcast form. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he he's part of what made this show happen and he always referred to it as masters of the universe yep. and there's a whole lot of people out there saying well kevin said he man he man he man he man he man and he didn't he said masters of the universe for yeah. years long before this show ever became a reality mm -hmm. he was saying masters of the universe yeah um and so no i never saw an ad so i can't speak to that aspect of things but the kevin deniers i wish would just shut up <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's cool. I I like Shira better. Shira was amazing. Master of the Universe. I, I'm not digging as much as I like Shira, and see, I'm not the target audience for Shira at all. But I thought Shira was better. See, I'm still That's, getting I'm still getting a lot of of feels like they represented the old show oh, really yeah. well. <laughs> they did. It, it, they, the whole tongue in cheek. They they make fun of the fact that it was a joke. <laughs> and he and 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 they got some lines apologetically. They yes. got some lines into that show mm -hmm. that I never thought I would see in a cartoon yes. like that. No, I agree. There's there's <laughs> some. Like I said we haven't quite finished that. Actually, Deanna tried to convince me last night. Instead, we watched an episode of Star Wars. Uh, uh, what is it? Clone Wars. We're in the middle of the Mandalorian arc that would explain a lot of stuff that was happening in Mandalorian. All right. Well, Pax the Paladin asks, anything you have changed your mind about? A game you changed from liking to not liking, or vice versa? A genre, mechanic, mechanism, creator, publisher, <laughs> trend that you came around on? All right, I got to say, that one I almost want to save for a full episode. I think that would be actually a really good topic to cover in depth. Okay. Because there's multiples. Now, what I'll do is I'll do short form. 
I'm trying to think of something. I know what's happened. Um, drawing a blank off the top of my head, which is another reason. Um, not mechanics, creators, publishers, anything like that. Um, there are some publishers that I don't think produce better as good a games as other publishers. Um, cool Mini or not is so all over the place. Like they go from these awesome, huge, big games and then to these other little tiny boxes that no one's ever heard of, like, say, Cronia. And it's so strange. But, like, I'm just, I know there are games out there. I have a feeling Scythe will be one, but it isn't yet. I haven't, I haven't actually played it again. If if I continued working with um, Stonemaier Games, which are, we're hoping, is that that may be the next game I try to review if, if they're willing to do an older game just to give Scythe another chance. Um, Eminent Domain, there's there's a perfect example. Uh, that goes back to our first year of podcasting. We were at their second year. I don't even know now. We did a bunch of the expansions for that game, but my friend Ross is the one that introduced me to the game, and I just didn't get it. I did not like it. I, I didn't like the whole thing where it, it's a deck builder, but it's based on what action you take. And then when you do that action, you get more of that action. So you get better at it, but then you fill your deck with it. So now you get worse because you're too good at the one thing and not good enough at the other. And it just, it didn't work in my head. Like it actually felt broken. And it wasn't until playing it again. I think I played again with Ross with one of the expansions that my friend Jamie got into the game. And I was kind of like, well, if they dig the game, maybe I should give it another shot. And then somewhere it just clicked. Like it just made sense. And I was like, I think I dropped my expectations, right? I, I stopped looking for the next Dominion, the next Star Realms, the next whatever. I don't think Clank was out at that time. Uh, Core Worlds, right? And it's all very different from them. And I went, whoa, this isn't deck building like that. This is a totally different way to, to do it. And I fell in love with that game. Like, uh, if you go back about, I, again, I think it's about a year ago now, where we're going through Exotica and, oh, I don't even remember what they're all called. <laughs> Exotica, and uh, this shows how much I don't remember off the top of my head. Dominations or Escalation. Something? Escalation, that's what, that's what I'm trying to think of. We're still missing one. There was one that came out after Exotica. Escalation is now on BGA, by the way. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, we tried that. Wasn't that you have to play live on BVDA? Yes, you do. That one. Yes, you do. And this jumps back to our other topic. You know what really sucks? It's a TMG game. So I should probably rush out and buy that expansion right now <laughs> and, and see if I can get a copy of that. So that was definitely one. There are others. I, I just know there are. I, I know there are other games where I'm like, eh, I don't know about this. Um, oh, Cry Havoc. Just trying to remember the name of it. Cry Havoc, someone made fun of me for this one. So I showed up at the local game store. Steve is the name of the guy who owned the game, taught me to play it. I played it, and I was just like, wow, that's that's strange. You've got deck building. You've got a deterministic combat system, but with a random element where people can play cards to rearrange things. And these factions are so asymmetric that it's almost like – this is before Root and um, – vast right like at the time this was like man having to play a different faction is almost like having to relearn the game and again we hadn't gotten to that progression of like the root progression and the, the vast crystal caves or whatever progression where you literally do have to learn a different game to be able to play and that one i played it and i was like ah, i don't know and then i showed up like three weeks later and steve's like what the hell i thought you didn't like the game with my copy <laughs> but it was a really good deal it was like 25 bucks for a 60 dollar game and i kind of liked it and it had neat minis so i kind of wanted to explore it and what it took in that game was two things one playing three different of the factions and there are more there's four total and then playing with the fourth faction the fourth faction is the indigenous species on the planet that the rest are trying to attack and they played completely different than everything else. And that made the game. And I honestly think the best way to play that game is with four. You need someone to play the frog or whatever they're called. The, it, it's, it's very much um, John Carter of Mars looking. They're four armed creatures that are there. Someone's got to play them for the game to work, in my opinion. But once I tried that, I loved it. But then I put it on my... Um, at that, that year, I was trying to do a 10 by 10 list. So pick 10 games, play them each 10 times. By game eight, I was so sick of Cry Havoc, I never wanted to see it again. So that one was the roller coaster. That was the, yeah, I don't know. Oh, this is actually really cool. I like this. I like this. I like that. Okay, I never have to play this game. <laughs> I just kind of at that point felt I discovered everything. I played everything out. I tried all the factions. I still swear one's broken. The red faction, the mechs, uh, if someone knows how to play those, you can't beat them. Before the mechs, if no one knows how to play, the humans will win. But once people start figuring them out, I found them overpowered. Um, I saw the people agreed. They did put out an expansion that supposedly fixes it. 
I never picked that up. So that there's one where a, a complete change around. Uh, I have to say mine would probably be uh, uh, recently the most one that comes to mind is Jabuka, actually. Uh, okay. I saw you, you passed me the, the PR info that you got yep. that got us to. Yeah, because we weren't even sure on that, but that was one they reached out and I was yeah. like, I don't know, take and a look I, at this, what do you think? At, and I looked at the, the, the promo info, the PR, and it looked neat. Okay, this is fun. And then to find out during the review that it's a take, it's it's just kind of a take that game where you're you're stealing and, and, and playing mm-hmm. with that really kind of put a downer on my interest in the game, uh, yeah. I have to say. Again, because that's just not the game I generally go with. Um, now, D has finally gotten back to us on her favorite episodes. Uh, she kind of liked the Gaming After Kids episode, number 128, right. uh, the one she was in the, sh- in the chair for. And also liked uh, 119, which was history on the table and uh, surprisingly easy, where we talked about heavy games that are actually easy to learn and teach. Cool. I don't know, history on the table, was that, that was best historic games? Uh, yeah. Historic miniature games? I don't even remember what that one was about <laughs> off the top of my head. All right. Uh, Tis like a gray owl. What is your best hardware upgrade or what was your best hardware upgrade for the show? Peace, right here. Lights. Lights. Lights, by far. Lights. Any, anytime you're doing anything video, more light, more light, more light, more light. Lights. Yeah. Oh, uh, or the internet speed. That That's definitely, that. that that's <laughs> that's uh, a close okay. call. For the live show, the internet speed. Yeah. For everything else, the lights. Fiber yeah. internet, yes. Yeah, yes. But even the step up to cable from our DSL was a huge jump. Yeah. The, the better video card also seemed to help quite a bit. So I still want to up that again. I have to say cameras. Nah, you know what? It's a better camera, but I, it, it is. This thing is frustrating. But but other like, ca- but a lot of cameras could do the job. Uh, whereas yeah. without the light, doesn't matter what camera you've got. I have to say one of my favorites is my Stream Deck. Um, I've had this pretty much almost since near the beginning of the show, mm-hmm. and it is such a fantastic benefit to have that accessibility where I don't have to have my mouse over a certain place. I don't, I can be staring at my notes and I can still reach over and change our pages or do, you know, interactions and change the show Mm -hmm. at a touch. Uh, That's that one's been a big one for me. That's that's one I need now for unboxings. I know you're getting to that point. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Like I I now have transitions. You could get, we could get you the two button one. There's one that's just, that would probably work. And that's probably all you need. Yeah, I was right. So it's, oh, it's it was the one it was the one for uh, for Brian there. That's right. Game suggestions for a historical miniature war gamer looking to broaden into hobby board games. So I was thinking, I'm like, we didn't do best historic <laughs> games. That's why I was trying to remember what the what the twist was. Yeah. Uh, next up, uh, Pax Bellin asks, "What's the best mobile app implementation of a board game off the top of your head?" And uh, card games, one that comes to mind for me. Yeah, Star Realms. Star Realms by far. That is a fantastic app. I never need to play Star Realms in person. Though I'm getting tempted because there's like <laughs> neat gambit cards and stuff. Star Realms before that Ascension. Yeah, and Ascension was, was my goal. I, I haven't I never played Star Realms really in, in person. So yeah. I've only played it as a as a, as an app. And uh I admit I'm not even all that great at it. Whereas yeah. Ascension, I can't imagine ever playing that yeah, playing the board as yeah. a, as a, a game. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. No, Ascension's up there. I just know what it is. I haven't played it probably in two, three years, whereas I still play Star Realms every now and then. Um, Other ones that are really good is Sentinels of the Multiverse is actually really well done on the app and because it removes all that fiddliness. But there's a story element at the beginning that's a, a, a pain to get through. Like there's this really annoying tutorial that just a lot of people don't get, excuse me, past that. Uh, I, you know, Matthew and Dave mentions Ma- uh, Magic Arena in there. And while, yes, it's a good implementation of the game, uh, if you are playing publicly, there are a lot of negative aspects of the players that you have to huh. deal with that, that, to me, knocks you down some. Possibly. That one, I don't know. Um, other great, Onitama is Onitama, with a, where you can pay to get different looking pieces and stuff and change the theme. Um, Wait, Terraforming uh, Mars is a mobile app? I don't think so. There are Steam versions yeah, of Terraforming Steam Mars. Version of Terraforming Mars, which I actually, which is really good. It it's is, it's well, not the best. No, you know what? We say we like it, but then we sit down and play it and realize that it, it stretches out the game to twice the game the length. Yes. 
So uh, he has it on his phone. Oh, okay. So maybe it's a Steam app on the phone. On on Steam, the lack of ability to see other people's cards drives me nuts. I can't quickly look over and see how many cubes you have, what collections you have. I, I and even if I ask you, you probably don't know where to look to find that information, <laughs> even though it's all there. That is just frustrating. Yeah, and, and the time. I mean, we've played. Yeah games that you could you know two two and a half hours maybe you could play on at the table and we've stretched out to four hours uh long so well there you go it's on apple i don't have an apple device anymore uh, there we go unfortunately i don't know there's there's other really solid best though yeah between star realms and ascension whichever of the two you prefer in real life like i know people that are now up to the like 20 to forty thousand games of star realms <laughs> ben gerber who runs uh one of the me we groups used to run the biggest board game group on uh on uh g plus has played like i used to play with him regularly uh the star wars guy the the, the uh wayne humfleet i used to play with all the time i'll admit i don't often anymore but well, i still dig that app now I don't know this maybe maybe this there is a digital uh, an, a mobile version of it since there's a mobile terraforming Mars but I have to say the Carcassonne app from Asmodee is far and away the best way to play Carcassonne. Um if you if you love Carcassonne play it digitally. They <laughs> handle that game so well digitally. Yeah, there you go. These well, fine characters. <laughs> I've heard Suburbia is fantastic. I bought it. I haven't actually played it. Uh, I'd Small like... World, but that was it only on tablet. Small World Two technically yeah, yeah. is the app. Was better than the real game. Like I, I, we literally would bring it out to restaurants and put our tablet in the middle of the table and play Small World as if that was the board because you handled it exactly the same. Uh, it did all the map for you, the dice rolling, and it even better packed up all the stuff because sorting the stuff in that game is a pain in the butt. Uh, so that's I do good like, one. I do like suburbia. My problem with suburbia is it has to be on a tablet. Um, I found the right, the, the, the actual game was too small to play on mm. even on my like pixel XL wow, until yeah. I went, until I went up to like a seven inch tablet, I had a really hard time reading and, and playing it, but that's I do like one. the we, suburbia. We should have done this as a full topic. We could probably keep going. <laughs> Yes, Deanna is noting that Ticket to Ride is actually really good. You know what I like about Ticket to Ride on mobile? A game takes like 15 minutes. Mm. That's what I love about playing it on mo- on mobile. Fiticulture app. I haven't tried that. Mm. Uh, that it's it's just new on BGA as well. All right, moving on. Fiticulture is such a good game. It's been a long time, but such a good game. So Ryan asks, have you ever had to repost a podcast episode due to something unintended slipping through the editing into the podcast version? I know we've done it for YouTube. I don't know about on the podcast. Uh, to my knowledge, we have made show note adjustments after the yeah. fact, but I don't recall ever actually re-uploading the audio for a podcast. We have done it on YouTube. Actually, oh, yeah. very recently we did it on YouTube. Yeah, because unfortunately YouTube, I, I, I am bad for checking my work before I upload it. Uh, so I'll go through and everything looks fine and I'll do a quick uh, view through on the video editing app. Uh, and, and it looks fine, but during the rendering process, occasionally yeah, I, audio things especially go weird. Um, that's one upgrade I would actually consider putting in my, into my computer is there's a, a card I can get for that. But um, yeah, every once in a while, audio things just go really weird or I've, I've done something weird and we end up with like three hours of dead air mm-hmm. at the end of an app because there was one little image that was that I just dragged off to the back of the the video file and it rendered everything up until that um, instead of just the part I wanted. Yep. Uh, so yeah, on YouTube we do that uh, oh, not once a week, but once every two or three. Uh, yeah. Often, often <laughs> enough. That uh, happens. Luckily Mo has to watch through all of our content for notes. So yeah. uh, I, I usually get called out when I, when I make those mistakes. But audio. Not- we did, we did have to fix one audio file we sent for the uh, what you've been playing Wednesday. Yeah. Which we have no idea what happened, but it sounded like a doubled robot. I don't even know. Yeah, something that went, one was a disaster. Something went strange there, and that was when I learned. Listen to this before I upload it. And then that was one where it was fine at first. So I actually did check the beginning of the file. Yeah, but at some point it was like two minutes into the into the episode or into the the recording that it just went all sideways. 
All right. Uh, All right. Right now, I only see one more question for us to get to. So I'm still willing to go for a few more minutes here. So if anyone else has anything, if we haven't answered your question, we might have missed it. Feel free to ask again. We do have one more from Math Guy Dave we're going to cover. And then we'll give everyone a couple minutes. I see one already. <laughs> um, so we'll give you a couple minutes to get a couple more in. And then we are going to move on to the next part of the show where we've got a question for you. All right, so for, first up, Math Guy Dave, what game would you most like to see a new edition or deluxe version of? So I don't even know. Like, there used to be ones. Like, I remember thinking, this needs a new edition or a deluxe version, but, like, Hero Quest is coming, so I can't say that. Um, Thunder Road is coming, so I can't say that. You just copied the same thing somehow. Hmm. Um... Dark Towers coming. Um, I don't know. Like, like what? I'm trying to think. Like, like Eclipse got one. Like a lot of the games I really dig have already gotten one. Or I don't see what you do with it. Like Race for the Galaxy. What what would you deluxify in that? And I don't want a new edition because I don't want all the stuff I used to have become obsolete. Um, Terraforming Mars, they did a deluxe edition, which I didn't bother paying for because I didn't want. Honestly, I don't I don't know if there's anything. Okay, so I want the deluxified chips for Quacks of Quedlinburg, and I want a box insert to organize those. But I don't know if that'd be a deluxe edition or a new edition. That just I want to pimp out the game that I have. Um, so a deluxe edition of Quacks of Quedlinburg would be cool where it comes with those, but I wouldn't buy it because I already own the original if I didn't own it yet. So Quacks of Quedlinburgs, I do want to upgrade. So I guess that'll count in a way, because at least I want the container where you can stand the card up and there's just enough slots, depending like if it's a one potion thing, they all cost the same, it goes in one, or if there's three costs, you put them separate. I hate when my stuff gets obsoleted. It makes me stop playing the original game and not support the new one. And I know it's like not logical. It's it's one of those, what did Roger call them a few weeks back? Psycho mechanisms or something <laughs> like that. It's one of the psycho mechanisms of games where if, if a new edition comes out for something, that's why I don't play Viticulture anymore. Because I have Viticulture and I have Tuscany and then they put out the Essential Edition. And then supposedly that was the best of both. But then they put out a Tuscany expansion for that. And then there's like a Moors expansion, which I don't know if that's for my version or that version. And I haven't played Viticulture forever. And part of that is that I feel like I don't have the good version. I've got the old crappy version. Which again, it's silly. The game was great. I played it tons before then and enjoyed it. There's nothing that should stop me from having fun with it now. Uh, you know what? For me, what I would actually love is for DC to put out an official DC card deck building app, like app. I would like mm. a digital version of that game because one of the reasons I don't play it enough is, well, it's great to get out with my son or my daughter and my son or just my daughter and play with another person. I would love to play it single, but it's just a pain to set up and deal with, you know, sorting out all the from all the different, uh, you know, bits and pieces I've got mm -hmm. setting up a solo game just isn't worth it. Um, no. And I would love to play that game more. Uh, so if they put out an app with a half decent AI, I would be all, I don't even need all that much of an AI. It's mostly just randomized. Yeah. Um, I'd be there in a heartbeat. Yeah. So Roger is saying behavioral mechanics is a better term, right? Shouldn't it be behavioral mechanisms? <laughs> um. I don't know. I swear if we went downstairs, right? If we went downstairs and we, uh, we we looked at my game shelf, I'd probably be like, oh, that. But off the top of my head, I don't know. I don't need a deluxe talisman. I, 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 Dark Future should come back out. But that's not it. Just, just like Games Workshop, put it back out. Yeah, no, because, uh, yeah, yeah def I'm there on Dark Future. Yes. <laughs> I have no, to be honest, I haven't played it in so long. I should probably play my copy and then I'd know for sure. True. Because we, we, there were, there were definitely, it's I mean, a long that's time going ago. a long way back. That's way back. And, and, that's, and that's the high fond, school. our fond memories could be completely false. Exactly. Uh, I know been, a lot of it had to do with white dwarf articles that weren't in the core rules too. So that's also a big part of it. Right. So I know there's probably something better, but that's my answer right now. Uh, so apparently there's a legendary DXT app. It's a legendary system in an app form. So let's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You didn't like legendary as much, did you? Did I, you I never, I never gave it a try. I, oh, okay. I, 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 see, I don't own legend. I have legendary encounters, which is actually different. So I can't really show it to you because I only have the other version. <laughs> right. Somewhere I saw a question about your, the, the Sean game list. 
I think we missed that oh, one. Oh, I missed one. It must have been further up. I did. It was like before we got into the segment where people were shouting out things. Oh shoot! Uh, was something about the Sean must play list. While you, remember. while you, while you're looking for that, I'm uh, not looking. Or, okay, I'm looking. <laughs> they can I'm, ask again. <laughs> I'm scrolling back. Where, uh, Resul at five hundred two. Where did you get the paint shelf behind you? Now D answered this in chat. But... Yeah, my mother in law made that. And and if you can't see it, unfortunately, she made it and then had to take it apart and remake it. So there's like paint missing in spots because. She made it for Citadel paint pots. And at that point I had now switched over to Vallejo and privateer press. So they're taller. <laughs> so it's supposed to be rainbow colored. That's, that's that was what I was going for over there. But now I also have Reaper master series paints on there. So that, that is, that was my mother-in-law. And if I remember there was supposed to be a bars in the front too, maybe we took those off, but it works. Like it didn't need them. It did not need the bars to hold the paints in. All right, so we got uh, what game on the Sean Must playlist are you most anxious to play? Um, good question. I'm not actually even sure off the top of my head what's on that list at the moment, but I actually <laughs> really want to play Tapestry in person. Yeah, that's on the list. So I am opening the list to see. So because we could add stuff to it right now if we wanted to. Uh, and then I think we're going to wrap up with this last question question oh from... we're just gonna stop right there i was gonna try to find the one i think sean most needs to play oh, okay yeah yeah no go for yeah, it but looking at this man none of this i don't know I, I i don't know none of these stick out as sean must play these <laughs> like villainous i i just think your kids might dig it garinto i want to just play bruges i guess but i'm not like hyped i'm not like excited i was excited to show off eclipse what i think sean needs to try is anachrony but I don't even know what to do. There's a, there's a game where it's the opposite of the, the the new edition came out. I got the new edition. I bought the Infinity Box from Kickstarter. I haven't even opened it. <laughs> like, I'm thinking I should probably do an unboxing because it's a Kickstarter thing, and those tend to do well. And specifically, our Eclipse Second Dawn unboxing does really well. But I'm like, I have, like, metal chips. I have all this stuff, and I, I feel overwhelmed, and I'm not sure what to do with it, even though I love the game. So I think Anachrony should get on that list, but then I got to somehow open up my thing and figure out what are the luxified components and what are new rules and figure that out. So I don't use the new rules, but we at least use the upgraded components. All right. Uh, well, we got a few more came in there. Uh, right. Let's see here. Red Me More Ryan, what minis have been recycled the most to include in RPGs and board games? Uh, the um, Dungeons and Dragons pre-paints. Like like the the Wiz Kids Dungeons and Dragons pre painted miniatures from back when it was a collectible board game, I use those in like every RPG I run. We use them in Gloomhaven. I've used them in other board games. Now I don't have a board game where I stole them. Like I should use the ones from Descent, but then I'd have to go like find Descent and drag it out, <laughs> and then I got to remember to put them back because if I ever actually go to play Descent, I'm going to be really frustrated if one of the minis is missing. So I honestly, despite the fact that I own a number of board games with awesome miniatures in it, I almost never steal them to use in other games or even to use in a role-playing game. Now, those D&D pre-paints, though, I have separated in bags by, by species. We'll use that term, I guess. And, and creature type. So it's really easy to just go find my bag of elves and be like, hey, you need an elf miniature? Here you go. You got an elf miniature. So I use those all the time in all kinds of different games, sci-fi, fantasy, whatever. But as for like rating a board game, I, I say it's a good idea and I'd say to do it. But I've also used a lot of Warhammer miniatures over the years because, well, I have a lot of Warhammer miniatures. So I've used Warhammer, Tomb Kings and Skeletons and Orcs in many different games. But even then, like if I have a board game that has a bunch of Orcs and their standees, I tend to just use the standees. Like I, I don't generally go grab miniatures, even though I could. All right, Roger asks, have you ever played Imaginarium? It's got a cool surrealistic theme. No, is that the one that's uh, replaced um, Mysterium? That I don't know. I am looking it up. As Imaginarium are the best escape rooms in Toronto. That's probably not the one. No, 2018. I don't even recognize this game. Hmm, interesting. It, it looks like an over-the-top Kumini or not, but it's not. It's Bombix. Bruno Cathala, that's that's a big game name. Engine no, builder. this one I don't recognize, but it's got some really neat busts that people have painted up. <laughs> know what it reminds me a lot of is that game they're showing off at the CG Realm. Oh, with the steampunk thing, with the people. Yeah, this definitely has a steampunk theme. Mad inventor or mad scientist. I never got to try it. 
Imaginarium was cool. I have not tried that game. So there's one Roger can show us. Yeah, he's going to bring it one night if the public gaming ever resumes. All right. Yeah, Deanna's I- pointing out the, the metal money is the same, right? We picked up metal money, but unless it's specific to a game, it just it's too lazy to go find it and swap <laughs> it out every time. Same with even the iron clays. I use my iron clays with brass. I bought them thinking I'd use them for everything, and I use them with brass. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up with this great topic from Teeslaga Grey Owl. Best three-year veteran pro tip for new casters. I don't know. You probably know more of this than I do. (laughs) My first one is do it. Just get out there. Put your voice out. Who cares what you sound like? You'll get better over time. Like, don't. Yeah, absolutely. Just record yourself. Yeah. Um, Record yourself. and Put it out there. Put it out there. Uh, you know, eventually work on editing. The first thing you're going to want to work on upgrading once you, once you just get there and do it is work on your audio editing. Um, you know, I mean, everyone, everyone who's here live watched us spend, uh, a ridiculous amount of time messing around with video settings here at the beginning of the show. Uh, but realistically, the majority of people who absorb our content will never see it. Um, and even if something is ugly as sin, if the audio is good, people can put up with a lot. Um, your people are much more willing to listen to something that sounds good, uh, even if the if the video is great, than they are to watch something beautiful if the audio is painful. Um, so the your focus, the first and foremost thing you should be concerned about for well, really forever is the audio. And while it's great to, to buy some lights, you know, if you're going to do video lights, oh yeah, video. whatever camera you have, get more lights. You need more lights. You don't have enough lights. There are always more lights. Um, but even with that, you cannot stop worrying about the audio because that's what matters. So that's two. My third would be don't watch the numbers. Like they matter. Yes, they do. But don't, Watch the don't watch the numbers. Don't keep track of every new follower you get everywhere you go. Watch for trends. Watch that you're going upwards. If you see a sharp downward drop, be concerned what happened. But otherwise, don't even worry about it. Just put the content out there. If you are talking about something you care about passionately, there are going to be people out there that want to hear that. They may be a smaller group of people. It might be a huge group of people. Who knows? The important thing is that you care. And the content you produce, you care about. Again, that's where the audio quality goes in. Now we'll throw in a third, fourth, fourth tip. Don't expect feedback. You are probably going to shout to the void. Just assume there are people out in the void listening. Yeah. You, you and, and we have always gone with the adage, if no one complains, we must be doing all right. Getting feedback from people is, is, is worse than pulling teeth. Don't expect it. When it comes, listen to it, but don't expect it. And uh, if you are putting things out into a um, a format like YouTube, for instance, is a, is a perfect example. When you do get feedback, a lot of it is going to be utterly useless. And you're not you're not going to listen to it. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who are just going to go around and hate on things. And you just have to learn how to ignore that when it does come. Uh, yeah. There's always going to be somebody out there complaining about you. But for every person who complains, there's probably 10 people out there who love your work, but don't speak up. Mm -hmm. If not more. So Deanna is pointing out, have a website because she has seen tons of podcasts that don't even bother to have a website. And you don't have to have written reviews. Just have a place where people can find you when they Google you. So they, they're your contact infos there and how to get a hold of you and who you are and a place to like list what you're there for and what you do, your mission statement, all of that's important. The other suggestion, probably don't do what we do and try to put out things over multiple platforms all the time. Like despite the fact like, yes, record once to create six different types of content. Sounds great in theory. You still got to create those six different types of content. So you might want to back off on that. We've been off a little more than we expected with this. Yeah, no, take it easy. Again, just start a podcast. There's a lot of yeah, different start. different uh, ways to get your voice recorded and and then send it up somewhere. You don't have to, a lot of it's free. Um, mm-hmm. You don't have to spend money. You, Yes, your podcast can be a little more established and a little more polished for a little bit of money, but 
you don't have to be there. You can go elsewhere. No. Uh, the only thing I would say with that is be aware that if you start somewhere for free, you may have difficulty moving somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, moving that content to somewhere that is paid later. Yeah. You may have to oh. stop and start again if you're doing that. So just if, if you have long-term plans and you have any interest in, in growing, consider starting with a little bit of money at first. Otherwise, wherever, wherever you can works. No, like like it, if you have to like just record a video or voice on twi twitter and publish it like just get it out there start doing it don't don't hold back you're not going to get anywhere if you don't take the first step and now i feel like an old man <laughs> dad okay dad <laughs> all right next I got a couple of bellhop related questions for you for the lobby, but first it's time to reward you for being here tonight with another giveaway. It's been a while. feels like it's been all night. Answer the question to win prizes like a roll for it. Tabletop day promo card or the unspeakable letter promo card for unspeakable world words. The call of Cthulhu word game. Unspeakable world sounds like it should be something too. We don't we don't have that one though. All right, here's our next question. What was the name of our short-lived 15 minute or less YouTube show that summarized our recent podcast episodes? Do 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 silence for the podcast. Trying to avoid the silence. <laughs> dad advice. Marginally better than dad jokes. Yes. This was something I'm still shocked didn't work. Oh, I, I thought we had a winning thing. And it really didn't work. It did not work at all. And obviously no one in the chat room even noticed. So that's a good indication of how well it worked. We don't have any rules against Googling. You're welcome to head over to YouTube and try to figure it out if you wish. Everyone's drawing a blank. Wow. We could just not yeah, give this failed. that away. This one failed. And, and I, yeah, it's just, <laughs> oh, man. It, 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 was, just, it should have been good. It should have worked. Based on all the stuff that's like, this is what you should do on YouTube. I, I thought we had a hit here. Yeah. And instead, uh, we spent hours. And, Extra. And, and I mean, like, it was one of those things where because of when we had to record it, I ended up, you know, just busting busting myself trying to get it out get it turned around quickly despite the fact that it was a for me at the time a difficult video edit now yes. <laughs> today you'd be better at today it. i could probably turn it around with a lot less stress i've learned a lot of tips and tricks but it was still a significant amount of work to yeah. turn around you know a 15 minute video that nobody watched no one <laughs> No one. We we did get a comment on one of God Up Express. Dang, there dang, we dang. go. Oh, it's just that technically Math Guy Day is more accurate, but I think we're still gonna give it to Courtney. What do you let's, think? Let's let's uh we're gonna right, get uh, uh, D D, D, D you could be uh, Courtney already won once and Math Guy Dave got the exact name. All right, Math Guy Dave. Math Guy Dave. Math right. Guy Dave's gonna take it because uh, Yeah, that is the exact name, the yeah. tabletop bellhop express check-in. If you had both sort of shot up to either side of it, I think we would have given it to. Uh, there you go. Courtney's cool. Thank you, Courtney, for being cool about that. that uh, that's exactly the Red Maple Ryan. That, that is the one that yeah. I don't get. Like, like we, we were told YouTube videos, 20 minutes or less talking head right in the middle of the screen videos of what you're talking about showing up behind you. Like, like I really, like yeah. we, we, we tried to hit everything about it. And it failed. Like, yeah. like I, I and like going back, we do have a few episodes that have some views now, but yeah, I don't know. I, 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 don't I just know. thought that would, I actually thought that was going to surpass the podcast. It might've actually changed our whole format to become a much, to become something like board game blitz instead of what we are now. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Little they know a two hour groom haven or was the way yeah. that thing is still our most popular video. I know I, there. And every once in a while, we keep thinking of either doing more erratas or reading. Never worked. We did. We did reading. terrifying Mars and 
Yeah, no reading, one cared. Uh, I've talked about reading FAQs. I've talked about reading manuals just for the heck of it. Um, I still think that might pay an off, except Rodney did that for one of his Watch It Play videos, which was amazing. Some of the people in the industry are just brilliant, right? So, so one of the running gags with Rodney Smith is he doesn't do fantasy flight game videos because, as I mentioned about Fallout, they tend to be a little overly complex for a short video format. And a different tabletop board gaming podcast, Rolling Dice and Taking Names, kept begging him to do a How to Play Star Wars Rebellion. So for April 1st this year, I think it was, it might have been last year, April 1st sometime in, in quarantine, he recorded a How to Play and it is literally Rodney reading the rule book, <laughs> flipping the page and reading. It is one of the best inside jokes I've seen in board gaming. It was amazing. Oh. All right, moving on to our next segment of the show. So something else I did over the last couple of weeks leading up to this episode and technically leading up to last week's episode, which, again, we sadly had to cancel. I've been asking our fans to share some of their favorite tabletop bellhop moments. And I invite those of you here live who haven't already gotten back to us, join in with the same. What was our favorite thing we've done? What, what's your favorite bell, tabletop bellhop memory? What was your favorite review or what topic was the most interesting to you? Or what games did you pick up based on our recommendation? What's your biggest find? Like, oh, Mo told us about this game and I bought it. It's amazing. Or what have we done to improve your game nights? What, what, where have we succeeded in our goal of improving your game nights? I would love to hear any or all of that. And we do have some that we pre-recorded. So again, for those of you who had already sent in an answer, thank you very much. We'll probably get to it in the next little bit. Courtney wrote, my favorite bellhop moment was hearing you folks do an entire podcast on a question, question I asked. Awesome. It was very informative and has helped me get things going locally. Most recently, I've picked up World's Fair. Since I've started listening, Race to the Galaxy, Lost City's original card game, <laughs> Terraforming Mars Prelude expansion, and I know there are more I just can't think of right now. Basically, every list episode you've done, I take a note of the games mentioned and look into them. If you say they're good and they look and sound like something I'd enjoy, I have bought them. Our nice. tastes line up about 98% of the time. Not sure if I have a favorite review. Your reviews are always thorough and well-written, as well as voiced on the podcasts. My favorite topic was probably the top 10 of 1,000. I was it would live and going through the BGG lists with you folks. And that was, that was awesome. really fun. It was really cool and surprisingly difficult. Yeah, I need we need to find the equivalent of that. It's like I don't want to do it again yet. I definitely do want to do it again next year. We need to find the equi equivalent of that at some point. Wow, a uh, 98% agree. That's awesome. It's it's always awesome to find someone that you a reviewer that you agree with that high a percentage of the time. And I have a couple that I'm up there. But then I have others that I'm just like, well, to be honest, there's a couple I listen to and I don't buy the games they recommend because our views are so different. So that's the thing I honestly like that's what you should be looking for to me in in a in a reviewer is one of those two either someone you disagree with all the time or someone you agree with almost all the time so thank you for the comment courtney next i've got one from bike guy dave so i definitely bought go cuckoo because of the show and the deal i think that's in the last six months i also agree the episode of going through the top 1000 was really fun honestly i don't have a favorite review my other favorite thing has been the brunch soaps, as I most like the shoot the breeze portions of the podcast anyway. Slight smile. And that's been great. I, I have to say, I really appreciate the uh, enjoyment we seem to be getting off the brunch episodes. Again, this was something new we just decided to do. Uh, but in some ways, it's a throwback to the original concept yes. of the show, which was... <laughs> Two friends talking about stuff and, you know, but we don't have to talk about board gaming because we do that on a podcast. So we can just talk about whatever, although we do still tend to default a little bit more towards the gaming stuff when that uh, when that comes up. Yeah, no, that was something basically to go back to what Sean originally wanted us to do. But we still not be in the straight man who knows nothing about games. <laughs> like, I, I think Sean's original concept was going to be like, blah, 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 is a worker placement game. You're like, oh, what's a worker placement game? Yeah. I think that that was more the original concept. So we, we didn't go back there. Unfortunately, we started talking about games and Sean started playing games again. It's amazing how that happens. I should have stopped playing games. I should, I, I should have just fought you. No, yeah, I can't you go. play that. I don't, I don't want to learn what I'm what a. I don't know, worker placement mechanism is. Yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> All right. Well, Akela wrote, I backed Garinto because of you. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've influenced other games too, where they were in the back of my mind when I saw them on sale somewhere. And yeah, I'm loving the brunches too. So the brunches seem to be more popular than I thought. Like I was actually, I'm like, oh, you didn't get a lot. Like our first one blew up. There were tons of people there. That was awesome. And I guess they didn't like it much because they didn't come back. And I'm, I'm wondering maybe they, we tried pushing it a little later. It didn't work. But the feedback we're getting definitely is positive. So that's pretty awesome. So we do have one from the chat room here to go with it. So Ryan was noting that the top 1,000 was a thing they should have done ahead of time. It was a challenge to keep up with the show real time. Fair enough. Um, that's one of the advantages if you're a Patreon backer. We do now release homework on our discord to give people a heads up of what we're going to talk about he also enjoys the brunches though he's having to miss the end due to scheduling conflicts and being in the atlantic time zone so i I still don't know what's better noon or one i don't know sundays just they work for some people they work don't for others i think at this point we're going to either stick geez we're either going to stick with noon or one Man, this is a bad sign when we get to the beer. Jeez. <laughs> I don't know. This is a full Panzerati. That's what it is. My kids, here you go. Side note, my kids uh, bought me a Panzerati to celebrate our three-year anniversary. So I, I had some nice <laughs> Windsor Pizza Panzerati, but it's it's decided to uh, take its revenge on me. So, yeah, we might move back to noon. The other thing, too, is Deanna and I like to have date night on Friday nights, and not getting up early is nice, though it's only an hour difference. So we'll see. So, yeah, so big thumbs up there for those. And then Roger Malosh. Favorite episode was the trick-taking game episode. It was live and very lively. It was an interesting look into this odd branch of tabletop games, which is a cross between traditional and new games. He's picked up Azul, Fox in the Forest, The Duke, Red Seven, Medium, The Crew, Macaron, Garinto, Valeria Card Kingdoms, Carpe Diem, Gold West, Euphoria, and the Zaya Expansions. All of these were all a result of us playing games or corresponding, or more importantly, through the Tabletop Bellhop podcast. Thank you so much. Note some of these I bought over a year ago, but I'm not counting the COVID timeout, <laughs> which I think all of us going next year be like, what happened the last two years? That didn't actually happen. Yeah. That's a lot of games I've convinced you to buy. That's awesome. Well, and next up, we have something from Jeff Zeus, who says, you've convinced me to buy Fox in the Forest. Fox in the Forest duet. Medium, Chronicles of Crime 1400. You've convinced nice. me to put these on my shopping list that he hasn't pulled the trigger on yet. The Duke, Space Base, and Ghost Fight and Treasure Hunters. Although, how can you keep the Duke in your shopping list and not buy it? <laughs> my favorite shows are whichever ones I get a chance to attend live and interact with you guys. Super glad you record live. So that's awesome. That's good to hear. See, it's worth it, Sean. Love your review of the Alien RPG box set. I was waiting for it to arrive in the mail when that review went live, and you got me super pumped about what I was waiting for. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Timing's great. I actually, I actually sent that to uh, Phil over for Misdirected Mark this morning. He was asking uh, about whether or not he should buy the box set or not. And I, oh, nice. I said, yes, absolutely, and, and linked yeah. him off your article. Because, oh, yes, I mean, even if you don't want to play, even if you want to play something from the other source book which is what he wanted to do uh, mm-hmm. between the the cards for initiative and the tokens and the maps and mm-hmm. the dice you can't at the deal the, the price is just unbeatable now brian wrote my personal favorite topic is still what are some of the less known cooperative kids board games but i may be the only one for whom that was a special episode so yeah that was i think our second episode it was like second or third that was way back there we yeah. could have had that one as a trivia question <laughs> and that was of course brian's question right stumping the crew with my quest for two player only co-op games yeah it was hard the two player only co-op games that are good with two is definitely out there but two player only co-op games is hard there are not a lot of those. And again, uh, and, and we held hands is the only one that comes to mind off the top of my head. Now, Tisha Lager Grail says, I binged your first two years of podcasts, mostly while I was in the shower. You guys really pushed me forward into hobby board gaming. Can't wait to tackle the list of historical board game or of historical games. 
Yeah, I wish I could say you got me to want to try out historical miniature games, but I'd, I'd be lying. I think it's fascinating. I think it's a cool hobby, but I'll stick to my, the closest I'll be getting is Warhammer Fantasy Battle or something like that. The historical is just not mine, though the war games, I do dig. I, I really do. Command and Colors, honestly, is fantastic series. And then the, the American Revolution games, which now also includes Vikings. The uh, Birth of America series and the Birth of England series are, are my two strongest recommendations that I definitely enjoy. All right. Uh, where are we here? Well, we're going to, we're already going long. So I think it's time that we wrapped up and moved on. So thank you, everyone, for your questions, feedback, and import. You are awesome. Now, if we didn't answer your question tonight, Remember, you can always send questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you know where to go. Website, click on Ask the Bellhop. Now, before we get into talking about the games we paid the last couple of weeks and one of the final segments of the show, it is time for another giveaway. Answer the trivia question to win prizes like Get Over Here promo card for Boss Monster or the Needle Rapier promo for Mice and Mystics. Ready? Okay, what is the name we eventually settled on for you find folk in the lobby? After it ended up, no one but me liked Ryan's hoplites. I still like that one better. <laughs> yes, some some of there we the, go. Mountain Papa wins with lobbyist. Awesome. Yes, the lobbyists are lobbyists, which has nothing to do with voting. <laughs> We try lobbyists, hotel guests, VIP guests, but that's what we call our Patreon backers. It was a mess. So, yes, you are the lobbyists. Thank you so much, lobbyists. And now the Bell Hops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, I got quite a few today, and I have notes about all of them. So I'm going to start with Unfair, a couple different plays, um, one online, one not. Uh, we did sit down and played with Sean and Deanna on Tabletop Simulator in hopes to eventually playing a game with a couple of our Patreon patrons, which, sorry, that had to fall through. We still owe you. We'll get back to you. Uh, we used an official mod from Good Games Publishing. And I've got to admit, we were worried because it was just like the week before we tried out the Guildmaster mod, which is from the same publisher, and it was rough. We talked enough about that back on that podcast episode, but I will just say this one's way better. I, actually, I'd say a really solid mod. So if you're interested in learning Unfair, checking out the Tabletop Simulator mod is a good way to go. Now, the day we played, things didn't go as planned, kind of like today, and we started later than planned. And due to that, we decided to check out the lunchtime global modification, which unfortunately isn't in the base game. So I was hoping to use that as part of our review for the base game. I don't know if it's in the expansion or it's a promo. I'm cracking open the expansion this weekend. I'll find out for sure. So this is a, a modifier that isn't in the base game. So just be aware of that. What this modifier does is it makes unfair shorter. It removes one fun fair city card and one unfair city card, making the game only six rounds instead of eight. And it also gives you a bump in starting money, starting with 30 coins instead of 20. Now that worked, and I think pretty well, and, and the game length was about perfect for the time we had, but I did find it made some of the blueprints much harder to achieve. And I felt that maybe what they should have done is removed some of the more difficult ones from the game, maybe even a list of specific ones. So that. I don't know. It, it was an okay mod, but I don't recommend it. Like, I don't, I wouldn't say, well, if you want a shorter game of Funfair, use this. No, it like, if that's all you can fit, sure. But I, I wasn't a huge fan of that mod. Overall, the game was fun. Um, it was good to get to play it again. It was cool that Sean got to play it because he had played in person. I would happily play it on Tabletop Simulator again. I have no problem doing that. I am still looking forward to that patron game. But, of course, I prefer the physical game. Now, as for the physical game, we did play that as well. Uh, that was over at Brenda's place. This is our first time introducing it to our extended family. We ended up playing a four-player game. It was Holly, Gwen, Deanna, and I. Now, this time, I included the World Peace Game Changer. That one does come with the core game. This was because we had two people who had never played the game before, and I thought it might be better to learn the game without any take that going on. Uh, what World Peace does is you cannot play anything that affects another player, period. Well, even if it was beneficial, just you can't play any effects on another player. This time, um, it went over really well. Uh, everyone had a good time. 
Um, the only complaint made during the game actually came from my oldest daughter, who hated the fact we were using the world peace rules as she really wanted to use her event cards to hurt her opponents. Now, I have to think unfair, maybe one of those exceptions that proves the rule games mm. where it's a take that game that I enjoy. I really enjoy it. Now, I've only played it a couple of times, but the flexibility, especially when you add in that expansion that yeah. I haven't even tried yet just adds so much possible gameplay. And they've already announced the next expansion with four more oh, wow. decks coming. I, I forget what they were. There were some good ones in there, and I'm totally drawing a blank on what they were. I, if we can Google it later, maybe we'll bring it up. But yeah, there's a new expansion that's been announced. There's a Board Game Geek page for it. So if that's how I found it, is I was looking up Unfair, and I saw a new one, and I'm like, oh. Next, uh, Tapestry. Um, as we mentioned early in the episode, it's actually already one of my most played games in the last year. So we've been playing a lot of Tapestry in prep for our review. We've gone above and beyond our must play it at least five times thing here, which I think is important for that game because in five games, you're not going to experience everything. And while in a hundred games, you're also not going to experience everything. But that took some extra plays. Um, physically, we played it with Tori and Kat. Um, I got to see a game where Kat did something out of the box. She focused on the civilization map, the capital city board, and filled every single spot or else she would have. I happened to notice she was almost full and I snagged the last landmark she needed to fill the last four squares on her board. At this point, though, it was far too late. She destroyed us in points. Like, I think it was something ridiculous, like 27 times three and scoring victory points just for her board, which is just ridiculous. Um, I, I just think this was awesome because I never thought of building your city board being a valid strategy on its own. I always thought, yeah, you're going to get some points. You're going to try to do some stuff in here. And yeah, you might get some bonus resources, but like that was her focus. And man, did it work. I have to say, uh, that was something I actually focused on in the game, not to the level she did. I didn't try yeah. to fill it, but uh, I had actually made a focus on that. And I think we figured out that I there was a mistake I made that I could have actually scored even more off of that board had mm -hmm. I not missed something at one point. Yep. Uh, I hate you, Tabletopia. Uh, yeah. Also, <laughs> just, a, just a quick uh, mention, comic book, hacker, kaiju, and ocean. Yes. are the four themes in the new expansion due out next year. For See, I family. almost said Kaiju, and then I was going to say SeaWorld, because that's what the ocean set is, right? right. Is, is your SeaWorld. I couldn't remember the other two at all. So yeah, four more. That's going to add so many. So jumping back over, back to uh, Tapestry. Uh, the other thing we did is we tried the solo rules, uh, which were pretty solid. Um, what I didn't realize... Because when I got it, I just tossed the solo rule, like not tossed them, but like they went into the bottom of the box and I didn't look at them. I am not a solo game player. So take everything I say here for a grain of salt for someone who's not a solo game player playing a solo game. What I didn't realize is there's actually two bots in the game. There's the Atoma, which everyone seems to talk about, but then there's also the Shadow Empire. Now, if you play the game solo, you have to use both these bots. You use both of them. The interesting thing that I totally missed was if you are playing two player, you have the option of including the Shadow Empire. And what that does is improve the race for landmarks. So it's not me versus you. And as well as the race to the end of the progress tracks, it basically adds a bot that's going to go up on random tracks every turn. Well, not random. There's a system for it, but it goes up on tracks and may steal buildings from both of you. So it means it's not like there's buildings everywhere, which is kind of what it felt like when we played two player. Now, again, I'm not a huge solo game player, but man, it, it worked. It worked well. It felt like playing Tapestry. Like, it, yeah, I didn't have human opponents, but it felt like I still had to play my best. Though, fair warning, the Atoma is really hard to beat. Um, we only played, there's four difficulty levels. We played at normal, which is level two. Sorry, there's six difficulty levels. Six difficulty levels. We were playing at level two of six. And no, neither D or I even came close. Uh, like I said, that it destroyed Deanna actually worse than it destroyed me. She had a higher score, but the difference between the bot score and her score was significantly higher than the difference between my score and the bot score. And we both did very different strategies. Uh, it was neat. Like, like if you, if it was, it still is pandemic time for some people, but if you're still stuck at home and you're looking for a solo experience, 
I can totally see picking up this game just to play solo and then looking forward to enjoying it with more people later. Like, like it is a, it is also a great way to try out different civilizations and try out different strategies just to see how far can I get on a track doing this? How far can I get doing this? Or how does this income phase work? Or what happens if I go into my income phase really early? You can kind of play around with the game with it, which I dig. All right. Well, I got to say, this is one that's definitely on the list for me to play when I'm down soon, unless you guys are sick of it by them. Because while I hated the Tabletopia interface, yeah, I really saw a lot of fun in the game, and I really want to try it properly even if system mastery means you two guys have a serious advantage over me. I, when we played against uh, Brenda and Holly, they won, if I remember correctly. They they were first and second, and we were third and fourth. Or was that Cat and Tori? Cat and Tori. Sorry, when we played Cat and Tori. Cat and Tori beat both of us. Right. So I don't know. Like that, That's the thing with that game. There's so many variables and so many possible combinations. Uh, that, As we mentioned earlier in our review, um, that... You, you can't learn it all. Like I'm sure there is some level of system mastery eventually. Right. Um, that's the other thing when, when we, yeah. So Deanna did when we played our mom was Tori and Kat that beat both of us. Yes. They clocked us. Yes. That's a good <laughs> way to put it. They destroyed us. Um, so yeah, we'll have the advantage. Now this does play five players. I'll admit five players was not my favorite. It was a little long, but it might be one to play on the 13th. So, cause we will have five of us there. That might be a five-player tapestry game night. Though I'm still kind of leaning towards Eclipse, so it'll take us the entire night, but we get a full <laughs> board. All right, next, Lantern Dice. This comes off my pile of shame, not obligation. Something I have sitting on my shelf. Uh, it's been there for quite some time. Tori and Kat were over. They spotted it the week before. We're like, ooh, Lantern's Dice. We love Lanterns. How is it? And I'm like, I don't know. So I read the rules, and I taught them last Friday. This is a roll and write game. That's meant to be like a thematically the progression after lanterns, right? All the lanterns are in the water now. So you have this, this sheet that has the, the map of the water, right? Like the, the lake, the pond, sorry, that's the word, the pond with all the lanterns in it. And what you're trying to do now is shoot fireworks, setting off fireworks. And you do that by putting on polyominoes onto your board, by filling in spots, by scratching them off. And the way that works is a neat mechanic that calls back to the original game where you roll these four lantern dice into the special tray that makes it so they always land in a two by two grid. You then rotate the tray. So each die is pointing to one of the four players and then the players get to then scratch off lanterns of that color. So yes, it's a roll and write, just a kind of unique one. I like how this took the basic mechanic of lanterns, the whole, I put a tile out, I get a thing and everyone else gets a thing. Well, instead of putting a tile out, you're doing it with the dice. And that's really neat. Like they did a great job of recreating that feel. Now the game itself is all about crossing off pairs to, to fill in things and earning coins for connecting um, the platforms kind of like in the base game and use the coins to do special abilities with the goal of launching fireworks. And again, those are polyominoes that you're going to try to put over the things you filled in. You get points from all that. Now an added bonus to this one was each player's pond, right? The sheet they got. It's actually unique. There's four different ones on the pad of paper. And you always make sure that everyone has like their label ABCD. You just make sure everyone has a different one. So that was cool because a lot of roll and rights I played, you get the same thing, right? Like we've talked about other ones you played before where everyone deals with the same results. Well, that's not like this. Everyone has an asymmetric board. All of us dug the game, all four of us. I'd say it's quicker and easier to teach than Lanterns. Um, it's actually one of the better roll and write games that I've played. I haven't played a lot of them because I'm not usually a huge fan of them. But that said, for me and Deanna, we both preferred the original. This was good. It just to me wasn't as good as Lanterns. And if I wanted that feel, like the, the big mechanic is that I'm trying to reward myself while giving the other players things and not help them more than me. For that feel, I'd rather play the original game. Yeah, and I probably would have gotten more games in in this past year if Rollin' Rights really did anything for me. Yeah. Uh, I do know so many people love them. Uh, and I had some fun with Railroad Inc., but generally, uh, if given any other option, I'd generally give them a pass. Yeah, I don't think this one would sell you on Rollin' Rights in any way. Yeah. Next, I have Aroma. Yes, we finally played Aroma. Uh, Tori, Kat, and I sat down, discovered this one together, and honestly, had way more fun than I thought we would. 
Um, this is a board game we've mentioned on the show many times as being one of the games in the pile of shame the longest because it required at least three to four players to play and you can't play it with kids um, due to having distilled, uh, uh, what do you call it? concentrated essential oil so it's it's not safe for young kids this is a game that uses these essential oils and your sense of smell as the main mechanics in the game it includes four different ways to play each of which were interesting in their own way now each of these games is of course about identifying the various scents and there are 20 of them total broken into four different categories there's trees herbs citruses and flowers now the actual games range from attacking other players by trying to identify the sense in front of them. And then when you do, they're, if once they're out of sense, they're eliminated from the game, so it's like a last man standing, to a liar's dice-like bluffing game where you pick a scent, you smell it, you identify it, and you hand it to the person next to you and say, oh, that's lilac. And then they either have to call your bluff or just say, yeah, you're probably the right, it's lilac. So that's just two. There are two other types of games. I think I'm almost ashamed to say we had quite a bit of fun playing with this game. We were all laughing. We were having a good time. Uh, Tori's sense of smell is definitely more acute than cat or eyes. Um, we did not include any of the flowers. So we haven't even tried all the scents yet. Now that said, the game's not perfect. Um, these scents are strong. These are uh, non-distilled essential oils. Uh, that's going to bother some people. Deanna, for example, is sensitive to scents and honestly had a hard time going down in the basement after we played. And the method used for getting the scents out gives you these like paper strips you're supposed to use, but like there's just not enough in the box. So you have to find some fact, but we did find once like they're little roller balls so they don't drip. Once we got all of them rolling, you could just generally smell them by taking off the thing. And then you'd use the strip to kind of get it going again. But like just trying to actually dab each one on a strip, there aren't even enough to play toys. And then, well, there's the whole fact that the company producing this game does promote the medicinal use of essential oils, which often can be very dubious at best. Though, thankfully, that's not really pushed in the game at all. So, Aroma, that it wasn't bad. I will be doing up a full review at some point in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I should be happy that they managed to make a decent game out of this really strange concept, very unique, or if I should be upset that what is often a market that takes advantage of people is marketing themselves with a fun game. But it's already out there, so good on them. Yeah, and then we did play with a pharmacist at the table who did point that most of their claims that she knew of were unfounded, but it depends how much they sell. Essential oils are not the cure-all that some people claim they are. And I'll leave it at that. Now, the last board game I got to the table was Circle of Six from personal friend of mine, Robert M. Everson, Bob, better known to fans of the Misdirected Mark podcast as Old Man Logan. This is a print-on-demand set collection party game that you can get from drive through cards. Uh, this one, honestly, is way too hard to describe in text. Just typing this for the show notes was hard. Like, if I showed it to you, if I had it in front of you, you'd get it in seconds. So, kind of picture, you've got six numbers in a circle. One, two, three, four, five, six. One of them's covered up by a marker. Each player has a deck of cards they're going to shuffle, and you have... The deck consists of the numbers one through six twice and two wild cards. Each turn, you're going to draw a card and then place a card in the circle on the matching number or discard a card and move that marker a number of spaces. You're going to collect the card the marker lands on, and then the marker is going to switch from counterclockwise to clockwise. It's going to keep switching directions. Now, if it gets back around to your turn, if any of your cards are face up, you get to claim those as well. Now, the goal of a round is to complete a complete set of one through six. It doesn't have to be your numbers, your cards, though. It could be anyone's. And that's basically it. You're trying to complete a set of six. Now, sadly, it did take us a bit to get playing this one. Um, the rules included could really use some improvement. Um, the, the closest thing I can think of, what it felt like to me, is that the folk at Gem are role-playing gamers. They publish role-playing games and GM advice books. And writing a role-playing game is very different than writing for a board game. And this very much felt like a board game set of rules written by a bunch of role players. And the existing rules are overly long and complicated, but still not quite managed to make sense and cover everything. 
Now, thankfully, Bob did teach us to play this game back at Origins 2019, 2018. I don't know. And as well as at Queen City Conquest, Sean's even played this one. So my memory of playing with Bob did help us get through the rules. Now, once you do have the rules, a round of Circle of Six is quite fun. It's a nice, light, take that party game. Things going back and forth. I'm like, oh, I'm going to collect my six. Oh, someone moved it. Like, it's, it's just one of those quick playing, light party games. A lot of fun. You can still interact with everyone else, talk, have drinks, whatever. It's something you play as a pastime while doing other things. The issue we found was that, well, a round of Circle of Six is nice and quick. And playing a number of rounds in a row is a lot of fun. The actual victory conditions, as indicated in the rule book, is one player winning a total of five rounds, which can lead to a very long game. Like, honestly, with six players, it could take 25 rounds for someone to win the game. That's excessive. This is supposed to be a nice, quick filler game, not a tournament. Yeah, when we played it at uh, Queen City, I don't think we ever did a, a, a final, you know, we just played for a while and, and yeah. just moved on. So. And, and to be honest, that's what we did. We, we played about six rounds. We had fun. Someone won twice, and then we went, oh, someone won twice, we win. Now, it does know that a short game would be only three, but it also says a long game could be seven. And I just can't see it. Like, unless you're playing rapid, super quick, like there's a timer where you have to play within three seconds. Like, it's, it's a cool game, Bob. I'm not trying to trying to hack on your game here, but that's excessively long. I mean, that would be something you could play. Uh, I could see that, you know, if you're sitting at a bar and you're yep. drinking – and you're just playing it all night as something. All night while having drinks, yeah. yeah. But, but uh, even then, like, you wouldn't stop when someone hit five. You'd just probably keep playing. Now, what I did do is I know Bob, right? I've known Bob for quite some years. Bob's an awesome guy, and he's very good at accepting feedback. So I got a hold of Bob, and I pointed these out, right? I'm like, look, this is the part of the rules that wasn't clear. We weren't sure on this. I thought I remembered you teaching it this way. And, dude, five rounds is a long time. You might want to do something else. I think this is a great filler game. I think it's worth picking up, though you may want to wait till he puts out a revised set of rules because I think that is something that he's going to be working on that will be in progress. I did have fun with it. Like, it's a, it's a solid game, but it should be a quick filler game. And like I said, no, it, it shouldn't take me longer to play Circle of Six than it takes me to play Terraforming Mars. <laughs> Well, now I've actually got an, a new table, a game to the table here that I picked up on a sale recommendation from at underscore table or tabletop underscore deals on Twitter. It was actually cheap enough to get that paying to get it from the U.S. Amazon was still worth it here in Canada. And that is Marvel Strike Teams. Now, as usual, this is a new hotness. This is from 2018, but it's the first time I've had a chance to introduce my son to a tabletop miniature game of any mm -hmm. sort. Now, the game comes out of the box with a lot of stuff and an insert that holds the miniatures really well. The decks of cards really fit nicely and then expects you to dump everything else into a hole together. Even with my own supplied baggies, it took some thoughtful arranging of map tiles to get this thing to fit when done. Uh, now... Marvel Strike Teams is a heroes versus villains skirmish game, which uses hero clicks like figures. What's different is the base is actually used to track hero advancement in a campaign, tracking the level and build points available for each character. So I'm still baffled by why WizKids wouldn't make this a hero clicks game and make it compatible. Like why, why put out a game with clicks and actual heroes that could have easily just had, I don't, I don't know this, this baffles me, but I got to say, this does sound like a cool use for the dials. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so one person plays the villains, thugs and or mastermind while the other player plays other player or players play okay. a group of two to four heroes in a variety of maps and through a variety of card based scenarios. Mm -hmm. The game is really flexible and allows for a lot of play in this one box as a result. The maps are a really thick, heavy-duty, double-sided card. Uh, and even if you manage to exa exhaust all the scenarios and map layouts it comes with, it would be child's play to come up with your own, given all of the pieces that they have included. So this isn't two player only. This is a one versus many. Someone's the, the bad guys and everyone else plays a hero or two. Yeah. So it's, it's um, you, uh, but one, one player plays the bad guy and then you can have two to four play or one to four players playing the, uh, the heroes 
Uh, okay. It would be pretty awkward to have one on four. I mean, just space wise having four people, right. but it, it's totally doable. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask is, have you looked online? Are there more like have people done scenarios? Uh, I haven't checked yet. Okay. Uh, you know, it seems still... like I know there is an expansion as well. Yes, there is an X-Men, I believe, expansion, uh, I believe, to it. Um, yeah. but, uh, and I know people have been commenting on my Twitter feed, uh, that they already want more expansions. Oh, uh, there you go. so, uh, it is, it is love. So my only real complaint so far is that there are certain aspects of the rules that aren't as clear as we would have liked. This game could really use a reference card or a page in the back mm -hmm. of the manual that acts as a reference card. Sure. Um, now, what was nice was the game comes with a separate tutorial set up in rules, and it was really great that they eliminated a whole bunch of components they, nice. and they skipped over uh, one aspect that would have made it really important. So it's how you get action points okay. was not covered in the tutorial, except mm. unless you get action points, you can't do anything at all in the game. The entire wow. game is based on spending action points. Uh, that's when we're a designer. It's like, well, it's obvious you get. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it actually is on your player card, but okay. they don't point it out. So unless you know that this specifically is, this is how many action points you get. Mm -hmm. And this is what you can do. It doesn't like they, they, they've got a whole bunch of labels and things except on that, which to me <laughs> is the most important feature of the entire game. Wow. And, and that was, that was shocking. Uh, that they left that out. Uh, so once that was out of the way, though, because, again, we mm. had to figure that out to even start the game. But <laughs> once we figured that out, we really enjoyed the tutorial experience and felt more comfortable diving into the significantly more advanced main game. Um, so we've only played the tutorial in one game yet. And I'm going to say have more to say on this with a full review coming out once I get out the, tr the time to try the campaign mode. Sad, I'll rush out, check tabletop gaming deals or tabletop underscore deals on Twitter, see if it's still on sale, because I don't remember. If it is there, maybe Deanna will drop a link. All I know is even with shipping, it was like under 20 bucks for like a $60 game. Yeah, it was dirt cheap. I, it was there was really no cheap. way I could pass up on it. Yeah, I was tempted. I even play HeroClix. My kids love HeroClix. They're not old enough. We should try that with the full rules. Ah, oh, finally, the other thing I did this past week, which is gaming related, but not actually playing a game, was that I built the folded space insert for Zaya, Legends of a Drift system, and all the Kickstarter stuff and expansions. Now, I did that as a live stream. Now, thanks everyone who joined for that. Now, Sean's working on editing that. We'll be releasing that on YouTube when he's done. Now, when I agreed to check out these inserts, someone at Folded Space said, okay, you can check these out. This would be awesome. We'd love it if you live stream them. But please, please go to our website and watch our new and improved assembly instructions videos. Like, please do this before you review it. I'm like, apparently, all right, fine. Apparently they've oh. watched some of your other building episodes. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, so I'm glad I did because as you can watch my Gentis build or my Eminent Domain build, which are both from Folded Space, um, the way I apply glue to everything just took forever. It was hold the piece and put glue on all the edges, hold the piece, put them together, hold them for a bit and everything else. So what their new method is, is you build the piece, you dry fit it, and then you fold it flat. And all I'll say at this point is you fold it flat a certain way. There's a certain way to place the pieces. And then you literally just start tab to tab going first in columns, then in rows with your glue in straight lines, and then just fold it back up. And that was super easy. Like this method works so well, I managed to build a nine sheet insert in under an hour, which I think my eminent domain three sheet build might have took longer than that. Now, this doesn't count drying time. So that was the lesson learned. Uh, they do recommend quick drying wood glue, and I use traditional white glue, school glue, if you will, not Elmer's brand, but someone else. So if I have two more of these to build. I really want to go pick up some quick drying wood glue. That way I don't have to sit there until 20 to 50 minutes while we're live waiting for glue to dry. Cause that, that, that is about as bad as you can get for dead air. So quick drying glue pro tip, or next time I'll break up the video into two segments, like the build and then the reboxing will be two separate things that we'll have a break in the middle. So I don't have to make everyone sit around while we wait. Indeed. Well, now, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? 
All right, we got the anniversary out of the way. This was the big thing. So I don't have a lot like in stone going forward. So this was like, once we get up to here, we're going to do all this. Now we can relax. No, we don't get to relax. We're going to keep going. Uh, so Deanna and I do have a date night planned for Friday. I'm sure that'll involve some tabletop gaming, maybe a return to Aventuria or trying to finish discovering Shy Pluto for Space Base. Um, Sunday, we do have plans to head over to Holly and Brenda's. Um, that'll be after our brunch recording. So we will still be going live. At, I think we're going at one. Unless we decide to change it. We're going one. I think we're sticking to one, aren't we? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to stick to one o'clock. So 1 p.m. here on Twitch. Um, for that, my goal is to break out that unfair expansion we were talking about. I haven't played it yet. I haven't tried any of them. The new expansion has Alien, B-Movie, Dinosaur, and Western. I don't know if we're going to do all four of those or if we're going to mix and match. I, all of them have special rules, so I don't know if we want to dump them all on the table or what. But we're definitely going to throw in at least one of those new decks and try for a game of Unfair. And uh, for my youngest daughter, we'll be sure to keep in all the nastiness that we can do to each other. Now, again, I do have two more folded space inserts to build. That's probably not going to happen this weekend, but may happen in the coming week. But that's more of a maybe than a promise. Um, right now, I do not have anything to unbox but this, and this doesn't need to be unboxed, really. So we'll be doing that at the end of the show. So we're actually caught up as far as unboxings go, unless I start diving into the pile of shame. Um, and the lunch... Um the lunch expansion is in the expansion in that expansion. Yeah, I figured it was probably from the expansion, but I couldn't confirm that. I I, I wanted to double check that it wasn't in yeah. some Gen Con promo because they do yeah, actually have Gen yes. Con promos on that uh, expand on that mod for Tabletop Simulator. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm hoping to possibly start a campaign in Marvel Strike Force on Friday if my schedule allows, but nice. beyond that, uh, nothing nothing in the next week, especially so. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers who greatly appreciate their support. Now, normally it would be some of our guests, but you know what? We usually highlight five people per show, but since it's our anniversary and we wouldn't be here without you, I think we should go through the entire list tonight. Well, Zopi, thank you. Brian Sheehan, thanks. David Miller Jr., thanks, David. Brian Kurtz, thanks, Brian. Yuhuo Rutila. Thank you. Jeff Seuss, thanks to Jeff and his wife, Sheila. Kevin Renault, thanks, Tech. Timothy Smith, thanks, Timothy. Kator, Kat and Tori, looking forward to gaming with you. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, thanks, Danielle. Sean P. Kelly, the man with the best hair in podcasting. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks always, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on Twitch. Joe Swick. Thanks, Papa Swick. Evil John. Hope you're enjoying the vacation. Donna. Thank you very much. Courtney Jackson. Thanks, Courtney. Matt Lichtenwaller. Thanks, Matt. And Roger Malosh. Thank you, Roger. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, but that doesn't mean the party's going to stop. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. And as always, if you dig what we've been doing here tonight, it would be awesome if you would consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.